All right, good morning again, everybody. I want to confirm that you are here, me, Gilbert. Are you hearing me clearly? Yes, sir. All right, great. All right, thanks again, everybody, for joining us for today's another session today. Um, last week, we left off on the module for um, generating leads with target marketing. Let me just this, okay. The target marketing, and I um, just wanna do a quick recap before jumping into our battle drivers. Now, um, as, I, as, you, as you mentioned guys, I want to, 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 to one of the main outcomes, the, the, the primary outcomes for us, for this program is to leave persons with a formula for, you know, moving businesses online and, um, you know, in formulating one of the big things that we want to, we have to get right is understanding key basic concepts that are important to be considered when you are executing um, these types of, of, of digital initiatives. At the end of the day, um, anybody, almost anybody who can read and comprehend can get up and run an ad on social media. Many have tried it. Many are failing, few are succeeding. And the difference between failure and success in these executions comes down to how well you understand the base principles of, um, of digital and digital marketing, right? So we want to, I want to echo the, 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 the sentiment that, you know, um, for us to, to, to properly formulate and strategize, we must be able to understand the core concepts of, of, of how digital works and how lead generation works. And as I've mentioned to you guys that marketing online is very different from going from a traditional marketing, um, ways of marketing where maybe you put a, 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 an ad on TV, an ad on radio, adding the gleaner, running some PR, articles and then you go you go there and try to make as much noise as possible and generate as much attention for your brand you know of course yes some of the baseline principles are shared but one of the major differences between it, digital is that digital does not have that level of interaction that um offline has so when we execute digital campaigns we have to be extremely purposeful about who we are going after why we are going after them, which products or what value we are proposing to these persons when we are promoting to them, and what actions we desire them to take after interacting with this marketing material. You know, it, it's, it's very much a formulated approach that, you know, if you position the wrong value to the wrong customer, then you won't get any bites. If you position the, the, the right value, to the, to, the, to, the, to the right customer at the wrong time, you won't get any bites. You know, so understanding these little things make a very big difference. And as I've mentioned to you before, you know, in my business, I practice what I preach. Um, I've shared the story about, you know, my business background and, and how we operate. And I will tell you, as I mentioned before that, you know, after having an office for a number of years, I've come to realize that my office is really just, a, really just a space for my workers because we don't really see persons at our office. And you know, our website, our digital channels are where majority of our leads, our business comes through. You know, so I have, I have, I have, I have, I have, I have done it for my own business. I've done it for other persons' business. Um, so, and and I've gone through the teething pain of trying to figure out exactly what works, what doesn't work and why it doesn't work, you know? So it is very important guys to be 100% aligned. Have a, have a structure that is 100% aligned with the, with the key, the key um, 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 personality traits of your business, the key 
the key things that make persons um, buy from you and things like that, right? So earlier we talked about, um, you know, what is lead generation, types of leads, you know, um, cost, digital customer journeys, you know, how does a customer move from being somebody who doesn't know anything at all about it to becoming an actual customer through to loyalty. Of course, you also talked about, you know, sales pipelines, and we got into some target market segmentation and customer profiling. And as I mentioned, the target market segmentation and profiling, the role that they play is to clearly identify what type of customers, what do they look like? What's your, what's your type of customers, what do they look like? And you know, what products, how are you gonna target them? How are you gonna position your products to appeal to them? Right, so you have different things like your image, geographical locations, demographic like age, gender, um, race, religion, family, what type of work you do, psychographics that talk about lifestyle, um, you know, things that matter to you personally. You have things like your behavioral trends, like, you know, maybe you just got married, maybe you just got engaged, maybe you just had a death in the family, maybe um, you just graduated. Um, what are the things that are happening around you that will make you want to buy something at that part in time? So, you know, you have, because one of the things I have to keep in mind, guys, I'm going to get into this is that sales is happening right throughout the year. How do you determine which products to push to who, when? It's something that you have to figure out. You can't be pushing the same thing right through. Well, you can. You know, it's only one product yourself. But you're going to find that there are certain periods of the year where it is more economical. You get more, you get better ROI on your advertising when you promote products during that period. So even knowing that, you're going to, all right, during this period, don't spend too much on advertising. But, but during this period, spend double up or triple up on advertising. These are things that you have to consider, right? And we had the last question of what makes you what makes customers buy from the companies. This this insight, guys, is one of the most important insights that a business can have because it does it 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 determines what your messaging is, what your visuals are when, from, from, when it comes to art business representation perspective, how you show up online. So for example, in my business, I'll give you an example. In my business of providing technology services and guidance, because persons are relying on my advice, information and the technology solutions that I provide, I have learned that trust, trust that I will provide their ideal solution at a reasonable price is the number one buying factor for my customer. My customers will not move, will not, will not make one payment to any supplier until they believe that they can trust what they are saying or they trust them to deliver. As I said, trust to deliver the right value at, the, at a reasonable price, you know? Um, and once I understood that, once I understood that, what I did was to start looking for all the things that make persons trust us. So if, if you look on my website, you will see there are testimonials about um, from persons who have used the service. There are media articles that speak to what we're doing in the media. When you're in the media, the media is another, is another space that helps to build validation and trust amongst um amongst amongst um customers and you're gonna find that trust is 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 one of the also one of the other factors one of the main factors that make persons buy from it online because in an online space where um where fraud and 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 um and dishonesty is so prevalent persons will buy from you much quicker more well without even thinking about it when they trust it, which is one of the reasons why Amazon has thrived very well in this space um, because they have been able to build trust within their customer base. And how did they build trust? 
by guaranteeing that if it is that you bought something and you did not, there's something wrong with it or you didn't receive it or there was an issue, you can return it. No questions asked, no arguments and get a refund. And that allow persons all over the world to trust Amazon. That's a very big part, guys. I mean, of course, in, 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 in different businesses, it's not going to be trust that's going to make persons choose you because, you know, in my case, it's technology. But in the case of a beauty service provider like a Kim, it's going to be trusting that um, she is able to deliver a good service, you know, or maintain her appointments or provide good products, you know, things like that. But trust, guys, is very, 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 very important in the online space. And when, uh, when, when, when Gilbert gets into cybersecurity and so forth, you're going to learn a little bit more about um, things that make persons trust our website as well, you know. Um, but it is one of the key insights that I want to want to drive home, uh, trusting that um, the company will deliver what they say they will is one of the biggest, one of the biggest um, 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 things that make persons buy. I will tell you that up to last night, I had to book a hotel for a travel agency. I've never booked a hotel for a travel agency before because I always do it with Expedia or whatever other platforms. And I had to fill out this form. I had to take pictures of my ID, take pictures of my credit card back and front. And I was like, man, it's just too much exposure. It's just too much information. But because I know the, the, the company to be a reputable company and the hotel to be a reputable hotel, I'm saying to myself that, boy, you know, um, I know that this is a part of the process, and if it, this is how it works, then you know these guys must be um, must be able board with with how they handle this type of information. So I went ahead and sent it. A little bit paranoid, I must say, but you know it just it just reminds you how much that trust factor becomes important as part of the buying process. You know, if they, if there's no trust at all, there's no way I could have I could have sent through that, that that application form, and I'm sure in some in some um, countries. Um, sharing that type of data would would, would be um, um, actually um, not recommended. You know, of, of course, it's, 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 it, it is risky because it's people dealing with information, right? But um, I just say this. I just say this to share about how important um, the, the matter of trust is when it comes to um, digital marketing. You know, so let's talk about the value drivers and why value drivers are important. Value drivers are things of value that matter to different uh, stakeholders in the, buy in the buying process, right? So if a customer is buying from Kim's Beauty for Arguments here versus um, Tammy's, Tammy's Beauty for Arguments here, you know, what are the things that are going to make a customer buy from one person versus the next? What are the things that they compare? What are the things that they compare against uh, one, 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 one supplier to, over to another when they are evaluating a buying process? Because when persons are shopping, you know, and if you shop online, you will notice you know, the, the trend where you, you go to a website, you add some products to cart, and you may not buy it right away. You may go to another website, you add some products to cart, because you're evaluating what the different options are from, from, different, from supplier to supplier. Of course, you're gonna want the best price. You want the best quality. Um, you want you want it. You want the one who ships fastest. So you want convenience and and, and time of shipping. Um, you know. So these are things that you think about whenever you are when you whenever person are shopping online. So when you are structuring a, a business for promotion, for promoting it online. You have to understand what are the value drivers to tap into both for, both for the customer and for the company. So looking at this chart, it's still here. You will see that we have some customer value drivers on the left hand side. And we have some company value drivers on the right hand side. What does this mean? These are some of the things that you can add more because it's not an extremely comprehensive list. There are more value drivers um, that can be added based on the type of business or type of company. I should show them, but these are some popular ones that you can consider, right? So if I'm promoting Kim's Beauty in Montego Bay or overseas, 
one of the things that customers will value is the availability of the service or the products. Don't make no sense to promote Kim's Beauty if Kim's Beauty is fully booked until next year's summer. But there's no availability. Customer will get turned off and move on. Affordability is another valid driver that needs to be activated. Is the product available for the, sorry, if it's, is it affordable? Affordability is not based on is it cheap or is it expensive? But do you find the product affordable based on the value that you are buying? So if you're buying a lipstick that you think is supposed to cost, hundred dollars but it costs two hundred dollars but it's maybe it's a product that is very is of very high quality maybe you may consider it affordable another person who may not be looking for a product at such high quality and say no this is not affordable because i don't want something i just want something simple that can put on my lips and next two hours i don't need it anymore or something like that you know so affordability is kind of a range, but it is something that you have to consider and understand if your customer will consider you with this product that you're selling to be an affordable product or a reasonable price product. In other words, they want to establish fairness in the pricing because people who are buying quality things expect to pay a little bit more for the quality. Or you have some deal shoppers who just want the cheapest thing possible. You understand? So pricing fairness is one of the things that customers consider when they think about um, buying from it. Multi-use, is the product multi-use? Can the product be used in more than one ways, right? I have things to consider, persons determine these things. And this is why, you know, when persons are running, are running ads, you will, you will see them mentioning different features that a product may have to show that, you know, you can use it to do this, you can use it to do that. And, you know, because of its multi-use, it, it makes sense to buy this over 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 something else. so for example um i don't know if you guys know about it it's a product called swiffer which is kind of like a, a a dry mop or a wet mop something that can just take off um and and it can just put on a, a cloth on it whether like a wet cloth or a dry cloth wipe the floor take it off throw it away so you're not you don't have to go through the natural routine of putting a mop in a bucket rinsing it out wiping the floor sometimes you just want to wipe out the corner of the section, you don't want to go the whole nine yards. A Swiffer has to show why to choose a Swiffer over a regular map. A map is very traditional. Everybody is used to having a map in their household. Why am I going to spend more money on something far more expensive um, 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 that, 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 that is just giving me convenience, you know, to wipe the same floor? And the multi use is one of the things that I know that they use to, to promote it because I said, well, you can use that dry cloth. They can use that, can, can act as a dry mop, can act as a wet mop. And you know, these are different pieces that you can, that you can use. So multi-use is one of the value drivers that sometimes make persons buy one to move on next, right? Quality, as I mentioned, that's a no-brainer. Is the product of good quality or not? Is it is Kim's Beauty's product better quality than, than Tammy's Beauty's product? You know, these are things that they consider. Reliability, of course, nobody wants to buy something today and can't use it tomorrow. So reliability is very important when considering. So these these other drivers directly shape the communication that you use when you're promoting your products. You understand? So these are things that you want to highlight. Sometimes when we are running promotions or we are conceptualizing marketing communication, we try to, we, especially if the product is complex, we, 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 we are sometimes guilty of trying to make the product seem too sophisticated. But people are simple persons. Simpler the communication, the more you cut through, right? Um, ease of use. This is very important for products, again, that are not simple products, products that people believe um, are of a more complicated standing. So the SWIFA could be an example of that where somebody says, oh, this work, you know, this is not, not a regular map. And it's not gonna take too much time for us to, to put this together, to put this on. And they have to demonstrate ease of use. In the software development space, that is also a popular um, value driver that we have to demonstrate when we're selling solutions um, 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 to businesses. It must be easy to use. Too many times persons have acquired technologies and because of the difficulty to use it, they move away from it. So ease of use is a very important value driver. Features, again, 
uh, when you're buying things to use them, you know, having multiple features or understanding what the features are that appeal to your target customers are very important. So you have to highlight them. In the case of products that need after sales support, like maybe electronics, um, um, services, uh, well, being well supported is very important. So for example, again, in my space, where we develop technologies for our customers, technology is used as if it is not supported because there is going to be a time when something is not working how it should. And if, support, if, 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 if the product is not well supported, it's going to make the, make the entire user experience very miserable, right? So having a well supported product is very important and highlighting that is also very important to the buying process. Agility is another one for the service providers where, you know, is it that um, if I'm building a house, I have, to, I, have to, I have to build it block by block, or is there a way where I can put up walls at a time, you know? These are things that persons consider. How can we complete this in a faster, more seamless way? Agility speaks to that. Of course, if person have good service now, Caribbean is known to be a space that is poor at customer service. Very poor. And I've seen where businesses um, separate themselves from their competition by offering good service. So this is definitely an area, again, that I know our customers are, are vested in when they are choosing to shop from companies. Right? Of course, they have documentation, training, and you know, having brand name clients as other examples. So if it is that your solution is properly documented. So for example, um, I don't know how many of us are very handy in this room, but let's say, for instance, you bought, uh, you bought a little um, bathroom stand or um, a, di a dining room um, table, one of those um, this little piece of furniture that come, come in a box for you to fit it together. Some of the time you get these things and you, know, you don't even get a, a piece of paper to explain to you which piece is supposed to go where, which screw is supposed to go where. Um, and then you get a next solution from somebody else who, you know, gives you pictures and step-by-step -step instructions, labeling the panels, labeling the screws. These are things that are called documentation for the product. Is the product well documented, so that when persons are using this product, they can easily um, utilize it. documentation. Is also another thing that can be important. Trading <clears throat> for systems for things that need to be used again provide something to somebody and they can't use it, that's a big problem. And then another, another value driver is brand name clients. Now in the service-based space, brand name clients are important and persons want to see that. So for example, you'll see where on almost any technology service provider, you will see they put a list of clients that um, trust them or that work with them to demonstrate that, hey, you know, there are reputable people out here who are serious about business that trust us, right? Um, so these are the value drivers for customers that we what they want to highlight um, for the company. You now, whilst the company is looking for customers or trying to trying to trying to um, pull in customers by 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 showing them or demonstrating that you know these value drivers are activated for them, the company also has value drivers that need to be activated for them. And what does this mean? I'm running a promotion. What do I want to get out of it as the company? What is important to me? Is it awareness where I am introducing a new product, a new brand, and I want everybody to become aware of it? Is it increasing con buying consideration where persons are now thinking about using the product within their space or trying to understand more about the product? Is it trial where somebody actually buys the product, tries the product, whether it is for free or sampling? things like that, right? Is that what is important for me at this point in time? Is it getting feedback so that I can improve my product or demonstrate to customers that, hey, other persons have used the product and they think that it's really good? Is it getting a reference? Maybe because in the case of Kim's Beauty, Kim's Beauty is a perfect example for reference where persons experience her, her, her service and they may go back home first and say, hey, where did you get that style? Oh, you know, it's Kim's Beauty that did it for me. I want their number. Do they want to increase referrals? What is the aim of their marketing activity? What, what, what value do they want to extract from it, right? Um, and then of course, getting customers to spend. So customer value, I mean, customers spend 
spending um, 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 with me, right? But I forgot that this was not on slide of show. So let me present from current, right? Um, Let's move this. Right. right, so value drivers, guys, are important to understand because these are the things that will make a customer buy from you over a competitor and also help you to understand what actions you want the customer to take based on where you are in your promotional journey, you know? And keep in mind that, guys, hardly ever does a customer buy the first time they hear about you. So you kind of want to go through the different um, the sales, the, 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 lead, the lead generation process of become making the customer aware, increasing consideration, then trial, then purchase, right? Um, hardly ever does somebody move straight from absolutely not knowing you to purchase. And that has to be considered in the grand scheme of things. See, we have some things here in the chat. Let's see, I hear better on the morning. Okay, I, 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 SB, are you hearing me now? Am I, am I sounding clearer? I hope you're hearing me. Gilbert, I, I'm, I'm still okay, right? Yeah, from my side, you're good. Okay, all right. Maybe it's um, her, her volume or his or her volume. All right, guys. Um, Right, so after we understand the value, the value that we are 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 are, are trying to, 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 to demonstrate to our customers and also extract from our customers, one of the things that we want to we want to discuss today is is understanding um how you identify your most profitable customer. Now, why is it important to understand your most profitable customer? This is because guys. At the end of the day in business, yes, we want customers. But I will tell you as an entrepreneur, um, as a consultant, that you know, not all customers are good for you. Not all customers are your customers, your ideal customers. Um, and it's important to understand why you want to have your ideal customers being your, being your only customers. Because at the end of the day, guys, we, somebody once said to me that Layton, if you're going to be do if you're going to do very well in business, you have to learn to deal with difficult customers. But I personally don't like difficult customers because, of course, in nature of them, they are very difficult, right? Um, so when I'm when I'm coining my identity of my most, most profitable customer, oftentimes I'm looking for the ones that spend the most with me and also give me the best experience with them. Because nobody wants to be fighting with their customers every week, every month, having complaints, having issues, you know, um, with them all the time. It's important to understand um, which customers also deliver the most value to your business so you can focus on them. So as opposed to us, us trying to get customers, trying to get customers, we would instead divert our attention to trying to get customers who fit our ideal profile, which means, well, again, when we look at how do we identify our most profitable customers, I would say start with looking at, if let's say, for instance, you're a business in five, if you're a business, if your company has been in business for five years or 10 years, look at your customer list and look at who has spent the most with you over the last five to 10 years. When we we'll talk about customer lifetime value, right? Um, when you understand your customer's lifetime value and you understand what the picture of, or sorry, what the picture of um, your, your ideal customer looks like, then you can go after more of those types of customers. Now, if it is that you're going to be spending, let's say for instance, 30 US dollars to acquire each customer, then ideally you want to get as close as possible to the target mm -hmm. customer that is more suitable to you, the customer who, when I mention the price, they're not gonna beg you for a discount every single time. 
the customer where after you've provided the product or service, you're not going to complain every time. Um, you know, these are things that we look for because we'll find that some customers are just not good for business. And I've had to learn that the hard way. I have to have some meetings coming up where I'm going to have to tell some customers that we're going to have to move on from them for this very same reason. We're going to have to find a polite way to explain this to them. Um, but it is something that is necessary, guys, because customers who are not your ideal types of customers can be very draining of your energy and your business's energy and resources. You know, the amount of time that it takes to meet with them and keep them happy or to resolve issues that come with them oftentimes is just not worth the spend that they make. Some people will spend as little as possible and cause the most problems. Some will spend a lot of money and still cause problems. And you have those who will spend a lot of money <clears throat> and will cause no problems whatsoever, you know? These are things that we have to be very clear on when we are going into digital business because the, 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 the nature of the model of, of digital business is scalability. It is the ability to attract customers who are of value to you and to be able to scale that. If you're constantly focusing on the bad ways, then you are being pulled back behind. You're being pulled, you're being pulled behind, right? So identifying your customers to start with, understanding what the lifetime value is for your customers, what were the top, what the top five or top 10, customers, what does that look like? And try to get more of those customers. So what they look like can be looked at from a matter of age, gender, location, education, occupation, income, and that's from a demographical perspective. Psychographic includes beliefs, values, desires, fears, expertise, um, behaviors include, you know, their hobbies, socializing, um, how they socialize, how they buy, and lifestyle trends, right? So these are things that impact um, the type of customer. So for example, about Kim's Beauty, Kim's Beauty, her ideal customer is females, right? So Kim's Beauty is not gonna really look advertised to men to do their hair. But yes, you have men who have, who have long hair and may want to get services from a beauty service provider, but that's not the ideal customer, right? So she's gonna be targeting females. And when you think about age, Kim's Beauty, caters to females who are looking for trendy styles to make them feel confident, you know, make them look good. The age range that cares about that may be persons, let's say, who have the, who have the budget to spend with Kim's Beauty, maybe working persons, young working persons, to, to, to mature persons who are still in, in corporate. So maybe say ages 20, 25, to say 50, 60 for argument's sake, you know. Um, location, of course, for her, she's going to focus on persons. In, in and around Montego Bay, persons who have either just visited Montego Bay, just left Montego Bay, or live in Montego Bay, right? Education level may not matter for her because every female wants to get their hairstyle on regardless of education. Occupation may not matter, but maybe somebody of the working class may, may matter so that you know these persons can afford, um, can afford her styles. Income, again, that may vary. We just want to know that they're working so that you know, they can again afford the stars. If it is that she has products that are extremely expensive, then she can target persons with extremely high incomes, where that is concerned, right? Beliefs, um, Kim's beauty, you know, if you wanna go after persons who believe in looking good, feeling good, who wanna live their best lives, these are things that they value as well, right? Um, desires, again, to look good, to feel good, um, to be confident, Expertise does not matter in this case. Again, look at um, um, behaviors, the so hobbies. Hobbies may include persons who like to go to eat for dinner, um, socializing, maybe they like to go to parties, maybe they like to um, have house gatherings, maybe it is that they like to go to dinners and balls, right? <laughs> um, so these are things that they will consider. Again, why is that important? Because these are times that persons dress up. These are times that persons wanna look good, right? Um, then of course, um, buying and lifestyle, how these persons, how do these persons buy? Um, does Kim's Beauty prefer when persons come in and, and, and swipe by credit? Well, well, do they, do they, do they, do they have credit cards to pay online? Um, are, are these persons going to be persons who are going to walk in the door and pay via cash? How do they buy? These are things that will impact 
how came the beauty market to get to the top, top part of the customer. And of course, lifestyle in the beauty space is everything, right? People want to look them best selves, feel them best selves. And when they are going to their hotel trips, their dinner dates, their events, they want to look good and they want to look confident and they want to look trendy. So this is how um, Kim's Beauty would identify what her most profitable customer may look like. And then the reason for identifying that most profitable customer is so that you can target them 100%. I want to remind you guys that the reason why we're delving so deeply into the construct of, 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 of how you target customers is because all these advertising platforms give you the ability to target um, some, ver some areas of these are to make some assumptions and target persons based on some of these things. So if you go to, for instance, Facebook, Facebook can target a person who has just left a part of a country within the last six months. Facebook can target a female who just got married maybe in the last six months. Facebook can target probably somebody who just registered that they had a baby in the last six months. You understand? So these are things that um, you know, are very important to understand. And this is why you must be able to clearly identify on paper what that profitable customer looks like, right? Because you're going to be using the same demographics, same psychographics, the same behavioral trends to determine what your advertising selections are going to be, right? Next thing to understand with the customers is how do they buy? Are they making an order? Are they signing up for something? In signing up, is it a one-time sign up or is it a subscription-based sign up where they pay every month or every year or every period for a service? Is it a membership type of sign up where they, where they sign up and they become a part of something? where they share in activities, share in resources, share in, in whatever it is being provided. Do persons need to complete a booking when they're buying? Because again, these communications are important. And, and, and it, it, it's, you know, one of the biggest things that turn off a customer, when they see an advertisement for something, and then when they click, whether it is learn more or buying or whatever that call to action is that is used on the bottom of the ad. When they land on the website page or whichever place that you land them, when they go there, they don't see or expect what they're looking for. So if let's say, for instance, somebody was supposed to buy something you now, and when they go on the website, they don't see how to make an order. Once they spend two to two minutes looking for that and can't find it, they're gone. Same thing for signing up. If it is that you're going to be signing up, somebody you put an ad out there, sign up here, click this ad, and when they land on that website, there's no provision to sign up properly. Again, they're gone. You've lost them, right? So it's important to understand how your customers buy from you, right? How is that they buy from you? And some of us, for some of us, it's it's more complicated than others depending on the type of business that you have. But generally, it will fall in one of these um, um, four categories, by and large, right? And then, of course, you have requesting a quota. That's a requesting a quota is oftentimes provided, provided it's used for services where, you know, you have to put some things together to make the final pricing. Or there has to be some type of assessment of the system or environment before um, 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 pricing is provided, right? Um, so you want to ensure, again, that your customer, you're meeting your customer with the expected communication that they are looking for, you know? And also, what is also consistent within your particular industry, so if, some, if, so if your competitor over, over here is saying sign up now for the same service that you are offering, and, you know, that's what the industry standard is, then you can't come, to, you can't tell person to come and make an order. You know, you have to be very clear, guys about what it is that we're instructing person to do when we're driving these communications. Digital marketing is not no great big science. It's really just communicating to your customers using digital means. And the clearer, simpler communication is and the easier it is to follow by the customer is the higher your throughput rate is going to be, right? So we don't need to be jumping over hoops and 
putting on crazy beds and whistles to, to, to start running campaigns that are effective. What we have to be is very targeted and very understanding of who our customers are that we're targeting, right? Well, we're going to go into communication channels for landing traffic. All right, so we have so we have come up with a strategy. We have come up with a campaign that we are going to run, right? And um, we want to start promoting it. And this is where, as I mentioned to you guys, that e-commerce is not a is not a is not a one way um, thing where you, you know you only can do it in one way or another. When you are promoting online, there are many ways that you can leverage um, landing solutions. There are many ways that you can get customers or leads through the door to start buying from you. And I say this because as an entrepreneur, as an entrepreneur right now who is even um, restructuring my business, one of the things that we're always forced to do in the growth phase is to start where you can. You can't build everything, you can't do everything the first go. So right now my business have about 12 products to launch. I cannot launch all 12 at the same time um, with putting together brochures, pricing, websites, printed material, all these things. We can't do it all at once. So we have to do certain things in stages and phases, you know? So it doesn't, it's not because the company may not have the money to, to, to invest in, in these things is not the only reason for, 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 for taking a phase approach or a scale, a scale approach. You know, sometimes we have big companies who just don't have the human capital to put together all the resources in the time frame that is needed. But you can start somewhere, especially when you're launching new products um, that, you know, you just want to gauge the market, but you don't want to see what the response is like. You can start in very simple ways. And I'm going to share with you some examples of, of, of solutions that can be used to land website traffic and how, how and when to use those solutions, right? So first and most ideal solution for buying traffic is to land them on an e-commerce website or a vendor site. A vendor site will be like a marketplace solution, right? And I'm gonna explain the difference between the two. Now, your own e-commerce website, of course, has your shopping page and your logo and your own URL. So kimsbeauty.com would be would be the website, and you know you'd have your products being displayed for a purchase. Um, the difference between that and a marketplace is that a marketplace is a is a is a is a is a, is a, is a solution not owned by the company, but normally by the marketplace owner. And the marketplace owner invites companies to list their products on their page. Now you can. Companies will choose to do both or one for different reasons. Um, having your own website allows you full control over how you run your online business and how you display your products and just full autonomy over everything, right? So persons who want to have that independent um, 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 image, who want to have a, a, a designated virtual face, meaning that a, a, a digital business um, headquarters where a person wants to hear about your business, they can find you here online. We typically want to use a, a website or, 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 or an e-commerce website to represent their business, right? Then you have some persons who they're just building a brand there, oftentimes solo entrepreneurs or, or micro businesses. They don't have the resources to build out and run a full website. So they may say, hey, you know what? Let's leverage a marketplace solution just so that I can list my products and promote them. Because at the end of the day, you know, guys, what you want is a solution that allows you to get started. What you want is a solution that allows you to, 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 to show a product catalog and allow persons to express interest in buying said products, right? So both the e-commerce website and the marketplace solution offers these um, opportunities the customers, the difference between the two is that one gives you more autonomy uh, than the other, and the marketplace solution also normally comes with buying traffic. So one of the main benefits of participating in a marketplace solution is that the marketplace would normally be already advertising, or they would have already developed the, 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 the rapport with, with, the, with the general public 
to, 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 to have trust buying, to have buying confidence from them. So if somebody sees that you are listed on Amazon for argument's sake, they're going to quick to buy from you. I know persons who have their own websites and then when persons are ready to buy, it's an Amazon link that links them to, 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 to the product. Because again, once persons are buying from Amazon, then, you know, right away, the trust factor um, has been won, you know? So people use different strategies between using your own websites, whether it be an e-commerce website or a, or, or, or a vendor, vendor website, they will sometimes use a combination or of both or um, one or the other to determine how, how, they, how, they, how, they, how they position their products to the public. But the benefits of using these solutions are that you're able to display your products, your features, your pricing, you're able to collect orders. You're able to process online payments. It is very much self-serve, so your customer can come and buy from you without having to speak to anybody or interact with anybody. It manages customer data and enables marketing automation. Now, again, this is a feature that, you know, it depends, even in a marketplace setup, these things may be turned on or off depending on the type of engagement or maybe a type of package that you have signed up to, but on your own website, you're able to turn this on as you feel, right? Of course, again, both entities are able, both solutions are able to capture leads and sales information and also generate analytics, right? So these two are the top two um, solutions that any entrepreneur who is into product sales, especially, um, should uh, acquire when looking at um, selling online. You know, if it is that the vendor, just for some people, the vendor, the vendor solution may not be ideal. Some countries may not, may not have popular vendor sites or some countries may not be able to list on Amazon, right? But again, either one, once you're able to, so both of them provide the same function, just in a different way, right? And it's important to understand how to leverage both and why you choose to list on a marketplace versus have your own website or do both, right? Landing page and website. Now, what's the difference between a regular website and an e-commerce website? Is the ability to do business on the e-commerce website, right? So you find that a lot of product sellers gravitate towards an e-commerce-based website and a lot of service-based um, companies gravitate towards a regular website with landing pages. Why? Because generally the, 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 a service seller oftentimes has to explain a little bit more about what it is that they offer to get persons to buy. Sometimes they also require more touch points with the customers to convince them um, to buy. So you find that a, a, a landing page is all oftentimes information rich rich with information and sales information about 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 your your your, your website uh, yesterday i was reviewing uh, um a, a project for a, a client from from florida who is selling um who is selling who is selling um excel templates and her excel templates are financial templates for bookkeeping and you know you know in the us and these first world countries Taxing is a very big issue, and persons are willing to pay monies for help as it relates to dealing with their taxes. So this, um, you know, this this Excel template provider provides financial um, templates for for tax, and she's doing extremely well. She's in two years she has sold over five hundred thousand US dollars in templates. And you know, when I when I when I was reviewing her her her, her business, and I landed on her website, it was like an, uh, I was scrolling for probably like five ten minutes. And what she did was she did one one landing page website. She didn't have this big great website with many pages. Just one single landing page website with persons to view a demo video of the product and then click buy now. At the end of that video, and that is it, right? Um, what I say is to say that landing pages are normally information rich. Why? Because you have to give persons compelling reasons to buy. They have to demonstrate how it helps other persons, how the solution helps other persons, 
if you demonstrate what other persons think about the solutions who have bought it, explain to them what exactly they get, what they don't get, how it works, all of that. So generally, they'll find that selling services require higher touch point, more information and selling products. Comes to a product, once you can provide a product specification, the person understands clearly what they're looking at. It's pretty much a no-brainer. Is they don't want it or you don't want it. When it comes to selling services, oftentimes you're selling value. Because you're selling value, you have to make an argument for that value. After making an argument for the value, you want to either capture that lead as a, you want to capture that, that lead whether through um, some type of newsletter, sign up or a lead form, or sometimes you can drive them straight to sale, right? Similar to how this, uh, this, 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 this um, 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 template seller um, has been doing it, right? But landing pages, as I say, uh, and I put landing pages such websites because it's it's one of the same um are used best for selling these types of, of, of products and services, things that need explanation. So you see here where we say that that allows to explain the service value proposition, pitch and pricing. You can capture leads through the sign-up process, you can streamline um lead collection process and enable marketing automation. You can also generate analytics. Guys, remember I know what we said that. Selling online is not just about adding products to a cart and checking out, right? Selling online is doing business online, putting a product out there for sale. Somebody come and buy it, and you know you, you exchange data whether it is their information, and you give them a product and a receipt and so forth. It's not doesn't have to be a traditional way of adding a product to cart and checking out, right? There are many ways to sell online. Um, so this is a slight deviation from the traditional way of doing so. Then you have people who will leverage their social media pages. Now, I can't tell you how many Instagram and social media sellers are here in Jamaica who do not have websites. These guys have sometimes no physical store. Sometimes they do have a physical store. And uh, what they do is that they use social media to display that catalog. Persons message them to express interest for that communication. And then they will send their payment instructions to the persons for them to make payments. So yes, these persons do not have a full-blown website. They do not have an e-commerce platform with payment gateway integrated, but these guys are selling online. How do we enable them, empower them to, to do better at what they're doing here so that they can start selling on our website, which is of course more, 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 more streamlined. Benefit to selling on social media is that it can display your products, features and pricing, collect orders, communicate with customers. But what you're not able to do is to automate your business. So with a website, with, 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 with a website, whether it be a landing page or an or, um, or e-commerce platform, you will wake up with sales and leads um, in, your, in your pipeline. Yes, you can wake up to messages on social media, um, but you still have some doing it. So to respond to all these messages, you still have to give them the payment instructions manually. You still have to verify that payment is received manually. Then you go through the process of, of fulfilling the order, right? So social media is a stopgap when it comes to doing business online, but it's free of charge. Anybody can access it from anywhere, anytime, and it complements your, your website or your e-commerce platform very well when you can drive person from social media. To your website. Now, not all businesses do extremely well on social media. B2B sometimes is funny on social media. If you can do it, there are ways to get it done. And there are social media experts who can find different social media strategies that um, enable B2B marketing to be effective. But I will say that social media is a is a is a is a is a great space for, for consumer-based products, for lifestyle products for products that once you're eating, you're wearing it, you're traveling, things like that um, are very well. So Kim's Beauty would do extremely well um, with an active social media page, right? Just by simply posting about the styles that she has done, whether it is hair, nails, facials, body, body work, all those things. you see them doing very well on social media. Then you have the My Google Business page, which is another page that a lot of persons sleep on but it's actually one of the most powerful referrals or lead generators for business. Why is this so? What is it? My Google business page is one of Google's um, suite of solutions 
where persons can register their business location. It allows you to add things like um, contact numbers, um, um, address locations, put on your website. And one of the most powerful things about it is the Google reviews. I'm gonna talk about that afterwards. But the reason, one of the reasons why my Google business um, works is that my Google business categorizes businesses in different, um, with different categorizations. So for example, you can register under a beauty service provider, you can register as a manufacturer, you can register as a, maybe as a, as a, as a, as a, um, a medical service provider, a doctor. Um, and then when you search on Google, if one of the first places that Google looks um, for showing results is actually businesses listed in the, my, in the Google My Business page. So you will see where when you search on Google, you will see where um, on the right hand side, if, if, if you search for a business name or you search for a particular service, you will see lists of different businesses going down um, in that section. What about options such as Figaro and social pay using payment links? That is a good question. And I'm going to check to see if I have that coming up on these. No, but I'm going to answer that question after. after, um, after okay, I have, I have a question about the Google My Business page. Um, what if you have multiple businesses in one space, like you're renting a suite in an office building and you try to do that? I've, I've found difficulty in trying to register multiple businesses in, when you're in one location for that particular service from Google. So is there a workaround for it? Are you using the same email address? No. Are you, are you using unit numbers to separate them? No, so in this example, particular case, yeah, I know, sweet D, sweet E. Right, right. But uh, in this particular case, that isn't an option. So I, I suppose I can fictitiously say sweet D, sweet E, but you know, yes. it's the same location. Yes, you can. Also, is there signage for each business? Well, no, because with these SMEs, you know, sometimes we don't have, there's a tax we pay in Trinidad when you put up a signboard, so for property okay. tax. Okay. So a lot of people don't put it up. Right. We don't because put signage are, outside the building. Right. These are the things that um, Google looks for when they are registering locations. So for argument's sake, you will see here on my page where there's actually a picture of the business. This one is using Jamaica Business Development Corporation. Let's pull a random um, example out and paste it here, right? But what Google My Business does, because I've had the, I've had the unfortunate experience of, of trying to update or edit my, my Google Business page because I moved from one location to the next. And what it does, it tries to ensure that when you register a location, it's a unique space at that location. So the, 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 the address may be similar, parts of the address may be similar, but there is one element that is unique. Signage also helps, I've come to realize. So for example, yes, you can register my Google business page without pictures. But if it is that, let's say, for instance, um, so many times they will come up to you and say, do you have a sign um, that you can share? Well, it's, it's not post. only that they come to you. Uh, remember, we are all part of, I'm part of Google reviews. So if it is I go to a location, it's going to ask me, you visited this location. Did right. you see this sign? And they actually ask random people for random reviews to make it as fair as possible. Right. So even if you might fictitiously, as we said before, say that, you know, the business is here, they're going to ask somebody who might be in the area who's a Google reviewer, like a random right. person that they, well, they ask for once you sign up on the app. And if they say that they haven't seen any sign, then you run into problems with what you just did. Right, right. They do use signage as a part of identifying the business. You know why, too? What is to stop somebody, a random person, from going on Google and registering their business at your location? You know, these are things that they have to work around with because people will do these things, you know? So the signage know, is but that's, that's kind of what happened to me. So that's why I'm kind of trying to fix it. Yeah, yeah I understand. <laughs> we have a bit of a unique, have a bit of a unique situation there. Um, I, from my knowledge, only signage, only signage and um, 
and being very specific about the, the, the address makeup. So you know, if it's unit one, unit two, unit three, or A to Z, whatever it is, you have that on it. And um, uh, signage, as a signage seems to be very important with, 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 with Google. I have not, honestly, I have never encountered a client with a need like yours where they have multiple business places at the same location. So I can't speak to solving that problem specifically, but what I can tell you for, for certainty is that a unique address and signage plays a major part in being approved by Google. Because one of the things as well that I know Google will do is to mail out a, um, a verification code to the address that you say you are at. So whether you using a postal mailbox or it comes directly to your location, it will sometimes mail out that um that code for you to enter back into your Google My Business page to say that you have received that letter to that location as a part of verifying that you really are where you say you are. You understand? So the matter of you know identifying where you are physically and and verifying that you are really who you say you are is very important for me. Okay, thank you. Yeah, man, no problem. Right. So again, guys, Google My Business page is a very trusted source, very trusted source, right? So when, when you do a Google search, if it is that you're searching for, again, beauty service providers, and you will see Kim's Beauty come up on, 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 on Google My Business um, page is at the top part of the page, you're going you're gonna to click on Kim's Beauty. Um, you're not going to question if it's real, if it's valid. You're not, you're not, it, it, it's, just, it's just automatic, similar to Amazon. And Amazon, you don't know, think about trust and you know, if your credit card, it's being compromised, or if you buy it, you need to return it. Code. You don't think about those, you just do, right? Because the source is a trusted source. I say it has um, links to main communication channels and it displays important information like opening hours and even customer traffic. So it will tell you when a particular location is busy versus when it is not, and it allows for reviews. Now, let me talk about these reviews. Guys, Google My Business is the number one place to collect your reviews why do i say this i'm gonna i'm gonna give you an, i'm gonna give you guys a real example here i'm not gonna i'm not gonna um i'm not gonna just talk through this but i'm gonna show you straight up what i'm talking about here let me actually bring up a different browser sorry i'm gonna show you what i'm talking about here right so in Jamaica, I have a younger brother who is in business as well. Um, and he has a moving company, right? Um, sorry, let me not type in the, type in the name of the word. So moving services. So I typed in moving services in my Google search, right? Because I may have just bought an apartment or maybe my, my, my landlord tired of me and said, you're making up too much noise in my space, you need to get out. So I found somewhere else to live and I need to move my things, but I have no truck. I don't know anybody who have a truck or a van and I need to find a moving service provider. So I've come to Google and I've typed in moving services. Now you'll notice at the top of the search is Campbell's moving services. This is my brother's business. Um, a business that was started just a few years ago. There are companies listed here that are much older and much bigger than his business. How does he manage to arrive at the top of Google search? Well, the first thing is that he used an address within um, the, 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 the corporate area that does a lot of moving. So for instance, in the more uptown, midtown to uptown address where person are always moving into those spaces, um, he used a location there. But the most important thing that he does, guys, is he gets his customers to leave him positive reviews after they have interacted with him. What he does, after every single um, delivery, he reach out, hi, sir, ma'am, how was your service today? Oh, oh Mr. Campbell, it was excellent. All right, great. I'd love for you to leave a review for me, please, on my Google business page, right? Now, if you notice, he does that check before asking the person to, 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 um, to leave the review. 
because I want to ensure that persons who are leaving the review are leaving positive reviews on you, right? If you have persons leaving negative reviews, you're going to find yourself um, with challenges. In his case, he has almost 250 five-star reviews here on his page, right? And this is what allows him to rank number one on Google My Business. And this sing single ranking gives him business weekly. As I say, guys, once you don't know a, 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 a service provider and you go to Google to search, right away, Google My Business is going to be the most trusted source when it comes to that, especially when you talk about services, right? So this is a real example, guys, of how using the Google My Business page and using ratings and, and, and reviews as a part of your um, engagement strategy um, can help you to generate more business, right? And in a digital sense, what you can do as well, think about this. So for instance, you have an e-commerce website, right? Somebody buys from you, um, somebody buys from you, you can send out an email right after they have purchased or, or after peers. Let's say, for instance, they expect them to use the product right away. Or maybe they're going to take a week to use the product. You send them a, a message a week after it's high. Mr. Campbell, did you like the product that you bought from Kim's Beauty? Um, yes, I really like the product. All right. If you really like the product, please leave a review over here, right? You don't want to send them straight to the Google My Business page again so that they can leave a negative review. Are you, are you, are you didn't know about You want to collect that review. If it's negative, then you deal with it internally and try to fix the problem, but you want to keep your Google My Business reviews as clean as possible or as high as possible to ensure that you can get the mileage that comes from that ranking, right? So naturally, you go on Google My, you want Google, you do a search, Google puts the first business to you, you so that this business has 250 five-star reviews. You're not going to choose a business who, ha who has a thousand three-star reviews. You understand? It's automatic where the trust is concerned. And that is really where the real benefit so that comes into play. Before I run to this, there was a question about um, um, payment links. So you mentioned Figaro, Figaro Social Pay. So I don't know Social Pay. Um, I don't know which country this is. Is this is this available in a Caribbean country? Um, is this Leo Leo I? Uh, Onika. Hi, good day, Leo. Um, I think it, you Hold on, hold on. Could, 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 could you pronounce that person if I get me? Leo I? Leo I. Leo I. Leo I. Okay, okay. All right. Yeah, man. Where's yeah. social pay? I think you can use it in the Caribbean. I need to do some um some more search on it and stuff like that or whatever. But I know Figaro is one that people, some people do use. Yeah, man. So Figaro is one of first Atlantic Commerce's newest products. It is a uh, it competes with like a Shopify. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it takes a, um, a, a platform approach. We're kind of like an all-in-one platform approach where you can list products and it's for sale. It also comes with like an invoicing um, solution um, where you can send out a link. It's like over on PayPal where somebody sends you a PayPal link to pay. You can also send a Figaro link to pay. Um, and that's, 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 that's something that can work. But what I would say is that I wouldn't necessarily land. So we're talking about landing traffic, right? For, 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 for conversion purposes. Um, I wouldn't necessarily land the traffic on a payment page or an invoice page. What do I mean by this? So I'm out there, I'm running an ad, I'm promoting Kim's Beauty and I'm saying, hey, get this lipstick now, 50% off, right? Um, I would either land you on a website, a landing page, a social media page, even as far as a WhatsApp link, right? But I would not land you on a on a on a on a on a on a, on a payment link because oftentimes you send a payment link after you've had some type of conversation with the customer and it's no time to pay. You get me? So I would I would I wouldn't take that approach towards um, 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 landing traffic for conversion. Because if I go out there and I see 50% off um, um, lipsticks now for Kim's Beauty, 
And you know, it lands me unless it is that the figure. I know figure again does come with a shopping cart solution, similar to the Shopify. So if it's landing me on a product page, then perfect, right? But I think we're talking here about using payment links where it's the invoicing link where you have to put in the amount of money and maybe sometimes what you're paying for <coughs> or an invoice number or something of the sort. In that case, I will send the payment link after the customer has been landed somewhere and there has been some arrangement to move forward. You get me? But Figaro is definitely one of those solutions that can get you out the box cheap and easy for those persons who just want a simple, basic, way to collect payment. It is not the most recommended solution on my end because it is it does not it the Figaro platform is very limited. Um, I have integrated Figaro with WordPress based solutions before and it came with many limitations. But for what it is, it's a simple and easy way to collect payment that works. So for those persons who are looking for that and you can use it. An example of how I have used systems like this is to actually um, put it on my invoice. And maybe I can share an example of, of, of what that looks like. Um, if I can quickly pull up, if I can find one of my emails. I'll to find it in my email, guys. Give me a second. No, the I just try the last. If it's not there, then I want to show an example of how I use payment links in my own business. This is this opening? Ah. Uh, um. All right, so let's look at, for example, an invoice here. All right, so this is an example of how I use payment links in my business, right? So I attach it to my invoices so that it gives customers easy ways to pay, right? So I generate an invoice from QuickBooks. Now, QuickBooks in Jamaica, unfortunately, does not integrate with any credit card payment facility, right? It doesn't integrate directly. So what I have done, is to put in my footnotes my payment option. So my preferred payment option is bank transfer because nobody um, takes any more any money out of that. But I also offer credit card payment as a secondary payment option. I just put my payment link down here. So of course you're gonna come here and look for this amount. I'm gonna I'm gonna make that payment. So once I click on that, it brings up a payment form similar to what you could have mentioned with Figaro or with PayPal. Um, um, so see here. Can put in your name, email address, and it's something that has been built by us for us. Putting your invoice number for reference, putting the amount of money you want to pay, um, any comments, and of course you get into your credit card information, billing address, and you make your payment, and it's simple, right? So you can have different variations of this, and these are some of the type of solutions that we do provide for persons who want out the box payment system. I think this one is currently integrated with First Atlantic Commerce at the moment, right? I also have another version that's in, integrated for, with Stripe for my US-based business. So this is an example of how you can use um, payment links to collect payment. But as I said, I highly recommend that payment links be used um, after um, there has been an initial engagement. So I wouldn't land, I would not land the customer traffic on a payment link because there will be some disconnect behind what exactly is happening here. You know, I am expecting either see the product that is being advertised or have a conversation with somebody that bought the product and necessarily to be landed on a payment page, you know? So that would be my recommendation. So other channels that you can use to land customers are, you can put a phone number on a flyer for somebody to call or text or WhatsApp, right? Or you can put an email address for persons to respond to or a text messaging number for persons to use. Now in the US and lot of the first world countries, we're used to seeing short codes be used for promotions. In Jamaica, I provide a SMS service um, to, 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 to companies that use a similar type of short code system, but actually a phone number. So it's a virtual phone number. You run an ad out there, say you run it on, on TV, on billboards, on radio, and you want persons to be able to respond to that ad 
at any point in time. Text messaging is actually one of the best methodologies for collecting interest because with a text message, you can collect leads any time of day and night. Somebody is driving past a billboard at 12, 12 a.m. In the, in, the, in, 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 in the night. Um, and this is something that interests them. But there's nobody at your office to collect a call, to take a call, or, or for them to interact with to get more information. So given, if you give them a phone number to call, by the time tomorrow comes and I'm gone on with my day, I've forgotten about what I was interested in. I may not even have the energy to even think about it anymore, but because if you use a text message call to action on the billboard or on the TV or on the radio, I am able to just send that text message right away and next and tomorrow um, somebody can follow up with me to provide the information that is needed. This is a very useful way to capture a person's interest right away, especially when they are offline and not necessarily online, right? Email again is used a lot for um, professional services but also can be used for, for, for um, product-based services. Um, WhatsApp is another very, uh, it's a very useful tool that can be used a lot of persons do business 100% through WhatsApp and they send out a, the mail out, the, the message out like a catalog of what is being sold. I know somebody who sells like packaged market goods like that, they have a, they have a catalog, they blast it out on a, on a, on a Wednesday, collect orders up until Thursday evening, ship out on a Friday, right? Um, and they run it all through WhatsApp. So you can use different channels. And actually right now, if you have WhatsApp for business on your phone, you will see that you can even generate, you can start running ads to generate messages to your WhatsApp from, from WhatsApp, meaning that they are leveraging the, the Facebook. You know, Facebook is the same company that owns um, WhatsApp. They are using the same um, ad, 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 ad advertising platform to run ads that generate leads to your WhatsApp phone number, right? Which I think is, is brilliant as well. So you can use WhatsApp as one of those communication channels to land traffic. Again, as I said, guys, it's not just about building a website and having a landing page. You can use any of these tools to start where you are. So let's not pressure our companies to say that, hey, you must invest two or 3,000 US dollars to get a website up and running to be able to do X, Y, Z when they can start with the tools that they have. Of course, we want to get to the optimum way of operating, but we need to empower them to start where they are. And these channels enable them to do exactly that, right? Campaign mechanics now are very important. Um, very important to understand when running promotions. As I mentioned to you, there are different types of campaigns and different ways to promote. So I'm going to quickly run through some of the types of campaigns, promotion and channels that you use to run these campaigns, right? So driving awareness is generally one of the first things that a, that a, that a company wants to do. You've launched a business, you've launched a product, you want to make persons now aware of what it is that you are selling, right? So you want to drive some awareness. And the purpose of the campaign, I say, is to tell persons about what it is that you have to offer. Then necessarily to, to, to generate sale. I mean, Every small business, I know that markets, markets to sell, but there has to be a period of making persons aware before you know, the heavy sales come in. So platforms that are good for driving awareness are Instagram, Facebook, using email marketing, Gmail also, Google has, has an has a, has a, has a inbox marketing feature where you can actually run promotions to persons, Gmail. Unfortunate part about that is oftentimes end up in the promotions um, tab, of your of your of your Gmail, so you may not get as much visibility as you want, but it's a very cheap solution. So even if you get two percent or five percent conversion from that, then that can oftentimes be a lot more than what you'd have invested for the for the for the for the for the, for the advertising, right? And you have SMS, as I mentioned, if it's that you have like a if you have access to a database of customers, so for example, in Jamaica here, we're able to access um digital database. To, to broadcast messages to them. Um, that's a list of persons who you would not have access to and you can make aware of what it is that you have to offer. And of course, um, platforms like YouTube, you're watching YouTube, you see these ads come up on your website. Yes, you have these ads that come up on your, on your, on your, um, on your YouTube video when you're watching it. Again, another way to get um, visibility. And um, Google Display Ads, Google Display Ads, 
or when you are on these tabloid websites or on regular websites and you just see that shoe that you clicked on over on um on on, on amazon that's following you everywhere you are going you know this is, this is an example of a display ad that can be used to drive awareness right um search now search is one of the things that i absolutely love and firmly believe that every business must invest in google search why is this so when you're using awareness type um as you're trying to get out there to people who don't know about you when you invest in search you're now getting persons who are looking for solutions that you provide to find you right so it's kind of like you're using awareness as an outbound marketing activity and search as an inbound marketing activity, right? And I will tell you flat out that the lead that comes from search is a much hotter lead than the lead that comes from an awareness campaign. Why? Because in an awareness campaign, me as the mobile user, I'm browsing through my feed or I'm busy doing something and something pops up in my feed. Chances are, it may not catch my attention. If it does, then it may be a huh. It may catch my curiosity. You know what's the next thing I'm going to do? If I'm really curious about this product, I'm going to do a Google search. And that is where if I if if that if that if that solution of that company ranks first or early in the page, and again, it's a more pleasant experience from because I saw them, they caught my attention. Now I'm checking them out, right? I'm doing a Google search because I know I'm actually interested in what they have to offer, you know. Um, so you find that the Google search lead is far more of a warmer lead than the person who saw an ad and clicked learn more. Why do I mean by this again is that the person who is searching on Google, so that person, that example I used a while ago was somebody who saw an awareness ad and went to Google to search, which oftentimes is the case. I've run many ads before and majority of the, the, um, the leads that come to say that they did a Google search. Why? Other the times persons don't want to click on links because they don't want, they don't want it, they stop following them. Um, two, sometimes people just feel safer doing a Google search and finding out about the company in a different way, you know? Um, so that works. But the customer who went straight to Google search, I didn't see any ad or anything like that. Just like, for instance, the example I used earlier about moving services, my landlord kicking me out, I need to get somebody to help me to move right away. I need to find a moving service provider. I'm going to Google search and I'm looking for a moving service provider. I'm doing that because I need that service now or soon. So you find that the person on Google search is, on a different, is in a different frame of mind than the person who you have found on Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube. Because what you're really doing, what you're really doing is this disrupting your attention to what they were doing to capture their attention, to, 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 to notice you and your ad with a Google search somebody is actively looking for a solution to their problem, which means that they are much closer to making a purchase than the person who just became aware about what you have to offer. And that is very, very important. So for example, Google search ads, I never ever stop running Google search ads in my business. I run awareness ads up and down, but Google search ads run right throughout the year. It is the number one way how I get majority of my customers. As I mentioned to you guys, I have a SMS-based solution here in Jamaica. It's not much of us that provide that type of solution. And uh, I started sending messages to, on behalf of companies like Google, WhatsApp, Airbnb, Uber, um, just to name a few, because they were looking for a solution provider to deliver messages. To Jamaica. Now they are outside of Jamaica. They don't know anything about who is here. The first place that they did was I went to a Google search. I went to Google search. They found us. Uh, we arranged a meeting down in Montana Bay. Drove down. They vetted us, and we moved forward with the relationship. And we've been providing the service for probably the last three to four years. They were about, you know, um, and all of this started through a Google search. And all of it started through a Google search. And I can give you other examples of other customers, whether in Jamaica or outside of Jamaica, who are found us using the same thing, right? So tools, promotion, chances that you can use to, 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 to optimize your Google search includes 
running search ads itself. Search advertising is where you go to Google AdWords and you set up a campaign. You're putting the search terms that somebody's going to look for. So for example, you're putting search terms like in the case of Kim's Beauty, beauty services, lipstick, makeup, hairstyles, things that you're going to put up. When persons search for that Kim's Beauty rank, Kim's Beauty is also going to put the word Kim's Beauty in the search to ensure if by chance anybody is looking for her, they will find her extremely easily. You know what Kim's Beauty is also going to do? Kim's Beauty is going to look for her top five competitors and she's going to put their names in the Google search as well. It's a gorilla tactic, guys, to hijack leads from your competitors. So persons know about a bigger brand. Let's use the example of in Jamaica, furniture, courts. I think courts is even a regional entity, um, if my memory serves me correct, across the Caribbean, right? Courts is one of those um, 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 entities that sell very good furniture, very known. And you know, a lot of times persons Google courts to go on their website to see what it is that they have to offer, right? And what sale they have and what's going on. If I'm in the furniture business, I'm gonna put Quartz as one of my competitors. I'm gonna put Singer. I'm gonna put all of these big furniture brands, Ashley, right? I'm gonna put those names in the search terms. So when persons are looking for them, they find me. And this is how a lot of, lot of times persons do a search <coughs> to hijack, to hijack customers from their competitors, right? If you go online right now, you're searching for any email marketing platform. If you search for Expedia, you're going to see booking.com ranking on the same search with an ad. If you search for um, MailChimp as an email marketing solution, you're going to find things like active campaign and competitors ranking on the search. This is something that people do, guys, to hijack leads from their phone. So what we're, what we're doing is leveraging the popularity of the competitor to position ourselves to their existing customers. Because if we have a better price solution, if we have a better service, chances are we will steal some of those customers. So it's a good tactic, guys, that um, you can use when you are running these types of ads, right? Google My Business, we talked about that earlier and its significance. Search engine optimization is an activity, an ongoing activity that is done on the website to ensure that you're continuously ranking and you're showing the pages that you want to show. So you're putting in things like product tags um, and different tactics to ensure that when persons, to make your website more searchable and more rankable when persons are using um, um, Google search. Blogs are also a very important tool that can help you to search to, to, to rank on Google. So for example, in Jamaica here, I run, as I said guys, I run as right to right. But I also um, used to write blogs and I'm getting back more into blog writing now, especially that we're launching our new business. Um, and I will tell you that I wrote an article in 2018 when payments in the Caribbean was just like the biggest headache to figure out. Nobody could figure it out. Nobody knew where to go, how to do it. And I wrote an article about how to collect payments online in Jamaica. And I will tell you guys, to this day, that article turns over more leads than the ads themselves. Why? Because persons not trust a generically, not an organic, um, organically ranked post over an ad. Anybody can run an ad, and sometimes ads are deceiving. But when you actually see a post being ranked well on the first page, speaking specifically to what you're looking for, people are quicker to click on that post as opposed to an ad. So you found that I've spent maybe $30 getting somebody to write an article for me, or maybe I wrote it myself, I don't remember. But let's say I spent $30 um, on that article. 2018, that article for four years now have been giving me the most leads. That's what, 48 months, right, um, of leads that I've got. Now let's compare that to a Google search ad. If I spend the same $30 on Google search ad, I'm spending that $30 every, single month for 48 months, as opposed to when I spent that one third at the beginning of 2018, and still to date are getting more leads from that article than the ads itself speaks volume. So I spent the money one time and I'm continuously getting benefit from it, as opposed to the ads where I pay every single time when somebody clicks on it, right? So blogs can play a very important role and blogs can be used for anything. Blogs can be used to sell products, 
you have used to sell services. It doesn't matter. And then we talk about also things like product tagging. Product tagging makes your products on your website more searchable, easier, easier to find when persons are doing Google search as well, right? So I want to leave you guys with that recommendation that Google search is something to always invest in, right? It's not a seasonal thing. But people are looking for your solutions right through the year, right? And well, especially persons looking for your solution right through If your business is seasonal, and that may be different. But once you're, once you're open right through the year, you definitely want to run that continuously. And they have seasonal promotions to capitalize on popular commercial seasons throughout the calendar year, like um, the Christmas, your Easter, summer, New Year's, Valentine's Day, Mother's Day, Father's Day, Black Friday. All of these days are commercial seasons, are commercial seasons around them, right? And we oftentimes want to capitalize on it and using things like social media advertising is very useful in getting customers to consider you, but email and SMS guys. I want you guys to understand something here with these four channels that I mentioned here in, um, in, 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 in row three. You have mass media approach towards digital marketing, you have direct marketing. Your Instagram and your Facebook is like your mass media, it's like your newspaper, it's like your TV, it's like your radio for online, right? You want to just cast a big net and get as much people to see what's going on as possible. Then you have email and SMS, which goes direct to persons. So if it's other company is building a database of their customers by simply saving their phone numbers and names and, and email addresses, then they can push communication strategically to these persons to promote products and services to them. And continuous engagement using these targeted um, methods can reap far more results than when you cast that broadcast net. Now you can do them hand in hand as well, where you use the broadcasting net of the Instagram and the Facebook to really in interest and maybe a follow up with emails and SMS, or you can use email and SMS straight to your existing customers. But one of the differences as well is that for email and SMS, you generally would have to have a database already, but Facebook and Instagram allows you to tap into persons who are not within your existing database. So it's important to understand how to leverage these different channels when focusing on driving traffic to different um, initiatives, right? And you will choose to use a combination or one of, depending on what it is that you're doing, right? Then you have things like special offers, um, where you may want to have maybe a clearance sale or maybe you have start that is getting is aging i don't want to get rid of it before it becomes a certain age you can use the same facebook instagram um, email and sms to promote this then you have things like upselling and cross-selling which are more strategic and more direct forms of engagement so customer a bought uh, a, a, a lipstick from, from 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 kim's beauty we want them to know or rather they bought makeup from kim's beauty we want them to know take the makeup course Help them to learn how to apply the makeup and how to choose the, the best shades or how to mix shades to get the right shade and all these things, right? In this case, you're being more direct and more targeted. So you're going to use direct and targeted channels to do cross selling. You will never use Instagram and Facebook to upsell or cross sell somebody because Instagram and Facebook is going to the public at large. Upselling and cross selling needs to be a direct engagement. As such, you want to use direct communication channels to do that, which can also include full calling, right? Where you pick up the phone and you go through a list of person you call them, you introduce them to it and see what their what, what their uptake is like. Then you have loyalty and referral programs whereby you get persons to shop from you continuously. You know, Magna Card is a popular loyalty power points card here in Jamaica. You use a lot of supermarkets, pharmacies, and many other entities that we shop at regularly, right? And the purpose behind using um, the point system is so that persons continuously shop from the same entity. So instead of going to Price Mart today, I'm going to Mega Mart tomorrow, I continue to shop at Price Mart because, I, because of the points I continue to get back. Another example of this is, is traveling. Travel sites use point system to their benefit a lot, whereby when you shop with them, you get points back and you can use these points to purchase smaller services, sometimes stores, and so forth. So, for example, I shop with I use Expedia 
for all of my travel engagements. And, for, and, and, and I do that because and sometimes I could use bookings or Traviago or these other sites, but I use Expedia continuously. But that's where my points are accrued. I want to know that if I find myself in a country and um, the hotel did not provide um, airport transfer or pickup, I could use my Expedia loyalty points to get that free of charge. You and these are some of the benefits of doing these things. So what it does, it encourages persons to continuously shop with you so that they can maximize the points back benefit that comes with that. We've seen companies like the banks with credit cards, you not know, offering credit cards that give your points back as well. So that you continuously use your credit cards. So that's a way to drive continuous usage by using point systems. Now, e-commerce facilitates point systems very, very, very well. E-commerce platforms that we work with on WordPress allow you to assign points for every single purchase and allow persons to even use those points back towards purchasing products on your, on, 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 on your store, right? So this is something that you can use very effectively to do so. And of course, you can use email marketing to promote your point system. Referrals is similar. Um, we're, well, similar but different. Referrals is where, you know, loyal customers brag about you, tell people about you and get new customers to shop from you. And again, WooCommerce, WordPress, um, I think Shopify, all of these platforms have these different point systems that you can use. So re for referrals, you can actually have person get points for referring person. So, so Jim referred John, John made a purchase and because he, he, he shared a referral link, um, Jim shared a referral link to John. When John completes the purchase, it tracks that, you know, all of this activity was initiated by Jim's referral and automatically assigns a point to Jim's account. So the same point system that can be used to run a loyalty program can also be used to run a referral program. And they use that to get persons to, 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 to promote your business and you give them an incentive to do so, right? So these are some type of campaigns that you can run, guys. And this covers the entire spectrum from awareness to loyalty to referral, right? And gets persons engaged. And these are the communication channels that you can use to achieve that, right? What are some of the promotional assets that you need to consider when running a promotions? It's very important again because this is what cuts through the clutter. This is what breaks through the noise, captures the interest or attention of your prospective buyer and get them to consider you, right? So you can use video ads. Video is powerful these days. Video is the most impactful form of media. Um, and we see where TikTok has come to to fame because of it, we've seen where there's talks about Instagram being a, only, a video only platform for the same reason. Um, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't love the idea about face your business, but it's just coming back around to say that like, video is very powerful and video, especially for services that need to be explained, <coughs> um, are very important. Then you have um, things like flyers. You know, your flyers, you know, monographic ad that you run, but these days, because there's so much content on social media and people's attention span is so short. I always recommend the person that if you're gonna do a flyer, try to do a GIF ad. Um, and what a GIF is, 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 is a GIF is, is a flyer with moving parts, right? And uh, not necessarily those comments sound, so it's not a video where it's sound and moving parts, but it's an animated flyer where there are different elements or different parts of the flyer moving. And this is mainly guys to capture person's attention. So that if somebody is scrolling through a video feed, scrolling through their Instagram feed, scrolling through their, through their YouTube, I'm sorry, their, their Facebook feed, and they have seen your ad, they, they, oftentimes they have seen it because something moved and drew their eye to that particular area of the screen, right? So gift ads work extremely well for capturing attention over flyers, but video is the ultimate, right? Then you have things like downloadable assets um, that you can use. So for instance, in the, in the space where persons need to exemplify professionalism, need to get persons to see them as an author on a particular topic. Having things like guides, ebooks, training videos are extremely good assets to put out there to generate interest and drive attention and to position yourself as an author or a source that persons can depend on for certain types of information or services, right? So when you're choosing your um, promotional assets, be very intentional about what the outcome is that you want to have and also be very aware 
of what is that you're marking, what the requirements are? Is it something simple? Is this, or is it something that needs to be explained? Is, is the brand already a colorful brand that when you post a flyer, it automatically will catch person's attention? Or is it that it's something that will need some, some, some spruce enough or some liveliness to capture person's attention? So you have to do a gift. These are things that you have to consider, right? Then we want to talk about communication tactics to create buying urgency. You now it's one thing to run an ad out here, but if you don't make people feel like they need to buy it now, they need to get it now. Oftentimes people will bookmark it and come back to it later. Oftentimes people will say, you know, I'm gonna check this out later. But if I see an ad and I say, hey, only five spots left. Only if let's just say a training course that I wanna do, and I say, hey guys, only five seats are left. Then I'm gonna be like, all right, is this something that I really wanna do or I don't wanna do? If it's something that I really wanna do, chances are I'm gonna jump on that right away. I'm maybe gonna stop what I'm doing. I'm gonna jump on it right away. If it's something that I don't want to make past me, um, I'm gonna jump on it. And, th and that's what you really wanna do. You wanna use tactics that create buying urgency. So things like free offers, um, you do, persons love freebies, so you don't wanna make something free past you. Limited time offer, again, if it's something that's only available now, you may not want to make it past you. Limited stock or capacity offer, so whether it's limited seats, are limited products you don't say so you don't want to run on so if you want to buy it buy it now they, those things always work on me even if it's not real a lot of times we're on websites guys and you see you see a product saying only two left in stock and you know you see the counter going on and you see they have even little um pop-up saying somebody from china just bought this product somebody from 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 usa just bought this product and you're saying that oh, boy i wonder if people are really buying out this is just a trick but either way, because of your paranoia, you really want this product, you're gonna buy it. Oftentimes it works on me. And it's not even a matter of their, their um, me believing that, you know, people are really buying this thing. I just don't wanna risk it. I really just don't wanna risk it. If I really want it, I'm gonna buy it. And it's because they created the buying urgency. And one thing that I also wanna introduce to you guys is that we can sell products that we don't have in stock. We can sell products before we have it. We can sell products before they come to market by using pre-orders. We've seen persons use this a lot in music. We've seen persons use this a lot in digital sales where persons can pre-order something that is coming soon, right? And sometimes you can give persons a special rate to pre-order. If you have a product that is in high demand, a person's really wanting, you cannot manage to keep it in stock. You can use pre-orders as a way to con continuously um, have sales. And you can use your pre-order rate as a way to know how to stock your products, right? So using pre-orders at special rates can be an innovative way for our customers to stay on top of, um, of their demand, meeting their demand while, um, while getting the stock in and also continuously having sales whether or not they have products in stock. And this is the last slide we're gonna we're gonna touch on, which is um, campaign KPIs to track. Um, now, guys, you're running these campaigns, you're running these promotions, you're coining all these messages, you're spending all this money on graphic designers and video editors to come up with a great marketing campaign. Now, all of this does not um, provide much value or much or much. Um, yeah, much value if you're not able to, 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 to see exactly what is going on. You need to be able, guys, to, to track exactly almost every interaction with these assets that you are you are promoting. So, all right, so you launch a, you launch a campaign out there and you want to reach, let's say, for instance, you set some goals. And this is where KPI checking becomes important because you have to set goals for your campaign. So, let's say, for instance, I want to reach a thousand persons. I want to convert 10% of those persons to customers. Um, and these are the goals of the campaigns. Then we want to track your impressions. So impressions and reach, how many persons did they add show to, how many persons actually saw it. That's the difference between impression and reach. Cost per click, how many persons clicked on the ad and what was the average cost to generate each click, right? The total number of visitors who landed on your website on your WhatsApp um, um, channel, on your Instagram page, what are the number of leads 
that generated from the visitors who landed on that website. All right, so we got some leads, but how many of those were actually qualified leads? Remember what we mean by qualified leads? They have the need, they have the budget at the right time and the solution solves their problem. So they are qualified, right? They want it. How many persons want and how many sales opportunities came from that? And this is you tracking the promotion from it being advertised straight through to a person's purchasing. But of course, all of this has to be done against the backdrop of having some goals. But what you're doing, guys, is measuring how closely are you tracking to the goals that you set out to meet? That's, are you reaching the total number of persons that you want to reach? Are you getting the click-through rate that you want to get through at the cost per click? Because at every stage, guys, there's something to tweak, whether it is that we're going to adjust the messaging, whether it is that we're going to adjust the targeting, the age range, you understand? Right through until you, until you, until you meet the metric that you are comfortable with. And this is the way, guys, how digital marketing is done in a targeted way and in a results-oriented way. What we have a lot of right now is a lot of um, social media practitioners who make a lot of noise in this space. And they will tell us, yeah, man, there's great engagement with the content. There's a lot of likes, there's a lot of clicks, there's a lot of um, comments. But how is this translating to dollars and cents is what makes e-commerce work. And you know, this is where the gap is in this space where, where, where digital marketing and, and bridging the gap between that and e-commerce is, you know? I wanna open the floor now for questions before I hand over to Gilbert to talk about um, logistics and operations. Any questions on any areas of, of this presentation today? I know we delved in quite a lot. We have been um, a lot of information to digest, but I want to open the floor quickly. Are there any other questions about anything at all that I talked on, touched on this morning? No questions? All right, Gilbert, I'm going to turn over to you now. Um, Gilbert, okay. Yeah, man, perfect. Um, so I'm, I'm going to stop sharing screen so you can start sharing screen now. Okay, as usual, um, guys, you know, a good session from Leighton. I know there's a lot of content. Oh, hold on. Digest. Hold on, hold on Gilbert, my bad. I just saw that Andrea has her hand up. Andrea? I don't know if it was a long time up because I wasn't paying attention to this era. Andrea, do you have a question for me? Remember you unmute. Sorry, thank you. Um, well, I wanted to say thank you. Today's session is very, very engaging and useful. And, num and I wanted to raise a point that you made about the um, promotion and the and getting reviews in order to ramp up sales. I think that though it's a good problem to have a lot more sales than you can handle, especially when it comes to services, it's imperative that you have you craft a response already. For goods, you can say, okay, you're on back order until for 42 days. And the customer can decide if they want to stay in back order or move to another person. Um, but for services, no, when you say it takes six months to do, for example, a marketing strategy, and it's a large firm and it requires data, and you have to do your market research and so on and so forth. And it takes six months to even generate a draft. If you have four of those projects, four large projects, which is, you know, what 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 many firms dream of, then you do have an issue with quality and branding. Right. So for services, especially, it's imperative that we have a a pipeline of service providers, and just sign the subcontract. Do they take the time to 
to evaluate, do you do diligence, get your contracts together, put them into some onboarding, some workshop, and to have them in your, have them waiting to, and be ready for the projects rather than to, to be running around and saying, you cannot meet these deadlines. Right, right. right. I think one of the key things that, um, just to touch on that note, one of the key things that you want to do as a service provider is understand capacity. Um, and just like, a, just like a manufacturing company, service providers are, are, are bound by their capacity to produce um, um, the work that is required at a, at a, at a consistent quality. And uh, understanding capacity is very important uh, in that regard, you know, um, knowing how much you can handle and what mitigation strategies you have in place for when you are at full capacity. One of the benefits of having too much work is that you can also increase prices um, to, 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 to maximize the return on the time that you are spending. So you have persons competing for your time. All right, well, I used to charge $50 for this, but there are four persons who want to do it and only can do one at a time. Um, then I can, of course, increase my price because no, it's, 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 it's no demand versus supply. Um, um, issue that I'm facing, you know, so you can definitely do that as part of your business strategy. To, to, and you know, to, you know, it works in theory. However, um, depending on where you sit and the connectedness of your prospective client, you may find that there are many brilliant people in that lane. Um, and unless you have a particular differentiation, for example, you're good on business strategies for, for you have experience, evidence-based experience in say right. airport, you, right. you know, uh, train right. lines, you, right. those unique lanes, then right. um, I don't know, you, you know, we, we, I, I don't know how much of a, of a reality that is about the pricing. And right. wouldn't you have done that already, known how important you are and unique you are, and, um, embed that in the pricing. People would be endeared to you, clients would be more endeared to you if you say, you know what, if you have some data already, I would take it down by 5%, depending on the, 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 the quality of the data you have. So, you know, it reduces my effort. Uh, and so you'd have got, gotten access to it anyway, you know, but you got them endeared to you. And will they wait six months while you close some projects and then get back to them? Maybe the board will approve, maybe not. But the point is that you some you have to be sensitive to what are the triggers, what are the attributes of your particular lane. Right, that is that is that is very true. Make some make some very valid points there. Um, I think one of the things that can help a situation like that is if you take a for these set of customers, oftentimes also we try to focus on lifetime value, extracting lifetime value from these customers. So what we try to do is have a continuous engagement. And one of the things I'm, I'm learning, because I learn, I learn as I go, I'm, I'm, I'm a student of entrepreneurship and e-commerce, is that um, if I choose to engage my clients over a three-year or a five-year period, for argument's sake, as opposed to over a six-month or one-year period, I am better able to see what is coming and plan my resources around that. So for example, if I have four big customers, I just say, who are pulling on the same resources, but because I'm engaging with them over long periods and I can foresee what is coming and even structure um, the service to meet those needs um, ahead of time, because generally big companies, they do a lot of planning. It's the small companies that don't have the resources or are, are very responsive, um, but big companies tend to be far, far more intentional about how they move forward. So if it is that you engage um, the, 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 the clients in a longer term um, contractual period where you know, there is support given to them over a longer period of time as opposed to an on-demand um, 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 engagement, you're gonna find that you're better able to handle capacity. And that is something that even right now in my business transition, I'm doing as good because I'm coming from an on-demand um, 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 capacity management versus no engaging person in two to three year contracts because I want the ability to structure how we engage over a longer period of time because I have come to realize that my lifetime, my lifetime value of my customers um, is extracted over a five to 10 year period. 
makes no sense for me to try to engage them on a one on a on a on a on a, on a one year or six month engagement when you know the the, the value to be extracted is 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 extracted over a, a greater timeline. So that's 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 one recommendation. That's one thing to consider uh, when when dealing with services of that nature. But great point, great point, Andrea. Thanks for that. Uh, back to you, back to you, Gilbert. Yes, uh, thanks again. As I was saying, it's it has been a, a lot of content to digest, and I see I have some responses in the chat saying yes. So the questions may not come today; they may come next week, um, and they may not come in the form of question. They may come in suggestions. You guys tell us what you're doing in your respective areas, in your respective BSOs, and how it ties in with what Leighton has been saying. Um, again, that doesn't have to come today. As, as you notice, we, had, uh, we have one hour to go. I have a couple of modules to present. Um, today, I'll just do quickly operations and logistics. Next week, we'll cover um, cybersecurity, which I know a lot of you guys are very interested in. So uh, do you guys want to take a five-minute break? I found this on the web. All right, so there... There's a question, Gilbert. Let me just jump on that one. All right. So there's a question about the workbook uh, for the training. So whilst we are wrapping up the content for training delivery, um, the workbook will be should be ready uh, by the end of uh, probably the next week's session, maximum a week after that. At the end of the day, the workbook, what it will do is put together all the information that we have discussed in the training and map out a clear example of Kim's beauty and how all of his information translates. So for this period, we are working on imparting knowledge to you guys. And then um, after that, we will provide the workbook and just walk you through it. At the end of the day, at this phase, as, as BSOs, <clears throat> lot of the information will not mean a lot as yet until you start working with the, with the, with the companies, but it will at least give you a clear example of how these different tactics and all these different strategies are being used so you can understand it from Kim's beauty perspective but it will become more impactful when you start engaging with it with it with the companies but it, it should be ready um towards the end of of, of, of the lecture series so maybe i say a week or so afterwards we should be able to tie everything put everything together for you all right Gilbert, back to you yeah so do you guys want to take a five minute break and come back and I'll try to wrap up the next two sessions as quickly as possible? Or do you want to go straight through? Well, I should go straight through. Show of hands for a five minute break. At least we got a vote. What's that? I, I could take a break. All right, a few questions right. ask for a bit, so let's give them a break. All right, five minute break. Back in the twelve ten. Yeah. All right.
Okay, I'm hoping everyone is back. Ready to go. Can everyone hear me? Can you see my screen? Wonderful, thanks, Nigel. Wonderful. <clears throat> All right, so we don't have a whole lot of time. I'm going to try to wrap up these two slides as quickly as possible in the next 45 minutes. And again, you can send us questions. You can post questions in the chat as we go along. I'm sure Leighton and Lip can help to answer some of those questions as I continue. Um, again, what I speak about is not as um, engaging as what Leighton does. He talks about sales, which every business, everybody in business wants to do, make money. I try to, I try to keep you in business for long term. So we're going to go over what the e-commerce process is like in a nutshell. My first slide talks about um, e-commerce operations. And it basically lays out what the customer journey is like. So as a customer, most of you in this space would have done some sort of e-commerce shopping. This is the process. Customer browse your site looks at products, a decision is made, payments are received, and receipt is printed, we receive our invoices, and the products get delivered. But that's from a consumer perspective. Now I'm going to juxtapose that with what the business operation is like when that takes place. And so we have the consumer journey at the top, and on the back end, how do we get to this position? Images are critical. So when you deal with your businesses, your small businesses, they may not have the expertise or the resources or the know-how. Images increases sales by over 80%. So make sure you have proper images, multiple images. And I would prefer not to have um, still images, for instance, just a product images. We, as you're selling, as we said last week, you're constantly selling value. So what we prefer to see in the e-commerce world is someone engaging with the product, if you're selling a product, or someone utilizing the service, if you're selling the service. So you don't just say, I'm selling coffee. It would be nice to have someone drinking coffee with your, with your branded coffee close to it, right? So images that are engaging. Write clear and precise content about your product. Um, I think this might be better. Um, interact with your customer. SMS, WhatsApp, chat, e email, social media. Constantly, as you engage in the e-commerce operation, it's a constant conversation. What you're trying to get, you're not trying to win customers. You're trying, you're trying to cultivate evangelists, people who are going to go out and sell your products to you. Again, Nathan touched on this earlier, but this is the journey. This is where the journey starts. It starts with these little things. Uh, Gilbert, I Next step. I also want to touch on one thing, just a while about images. Uh -huh. Guys, when it comes to images for an e-commerce website, it is by, it is, it is the greatest investment you can make when putting together an e-commerce website on the product images. Why? When you look at any e-commerce website, it is littered 100% with product images and white space. Normally, every, almost every single, well, not, well, most websites are done with white spaces in the background to make it simple and easy to see the products. And the products, the beauty, the, the, the beauty of the website comes out in the quality of the images that you produce. So you see, it's, a, it's the same way when you walk into a business place and it look run down, you go walk into a clothing store and the aisles are jumbled, the, 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 the product presentation is not sleek and clean and looking good versus when I walk into another another business place where you know there, there's clearly defined aisles you're not you're not, you're not searching through rubble and it's properly organized to more polished and you have a better shopping experience the same thing with images people land on the website and it's the poor quality images they're not going to take the business serious bottom line you land on the website and it's a pretty engaging photos not only and also provide, if you can, encourage your business to provide if they can, multiple versions of the same, sorry, multiple images of the same product. So if it's a front shot, a side shot, a back shot, a top shot, a bottom shot, even a video of it, 
it guys it goes a far way so wanna echo that all right thanks Nathan and step back yeah so images as he has said it's it's so Nathan just presented a twofold aspect to what images means it's a loss and a gain on the gain side it increases your sales by over 80 percent on the law side, if you don't have proper images, people don't stay on your site. So it, it pays. All right, so the next step of the journey is the decision is made and various payment methods are accepted, hopefully on your website. And if these payments are accepted and they're valid, create a receipt. On the business operation side, you can't sell what you don't have. So we have an aspect of inventory management. This is not contrary to what Nathan is saying. This is just a different perspective here. Inventory management, as you receive your inventory, this is critical. You have to account for that. You have to know what you have. If you don't have it, how are you going to fulfill that order? Even if you've taken pre-orders, when that inventory does come in, you have to make sure that everything that you say that you're selling, that you do have in stock, you have the quantities that you intend to sell. You receive an order. There's an order reception process. And again, this goes back to whenever you're talking to your business, make sure they have processes in place. That's part of your business operation. So how does this work for a small business? Let, have them lay it out how it's going to work for them. If you have John that is doing inventory, you know, John does an inventory, he creates a checklist and he checks that off. If Mary is doing auto management, she takes the auto management. If Bob is doing packaging, he does packaging. So then it has to be a process in place. So then, the process is inventory management takes place and order is received, order management takes place. Packing, the package is properly packaged, uh, the, the products are properly packaged and labeled, whether they're hazardous, whether they need to be handled with care and tracking the details are applied. A verified handoff to the customer, this is critical again. If I'm selling, if somebody's coming to my store to pick up, make sure that person is signed in for the package. Make sure the person who is picking up the package is authorized to pick up the package, right? So there is a what we call a chain of custody. I verify that I had it, and this person verified that they picked it up for me. I verify that I handed it off to them. Again, this is interactive. This is a constant communication between you and the customer, and it's record keeping. These things may sound simple, but these are the things that keep your business going, longevity. The delivery process, business operation, ships item to the customer or make available for pickup. Customer verifies the handoff. That's important. Again, you reach out to the customer. Let's say you handed off this package to a courier, FedEx, UPS, whoever you have as your local courier. You verify that you handed it off to them. You verify that the customer received it. You as the business owner reach out to the customer to let them know, hey, we have a verification that your package has been received. How has the service been so far? That type of stuff. If they're not happy with it, this is where you make preparations for that return. Again, this is not an expense. This is an investment. That return process, as Leighton mentioned earlier, needs to be factored in every step of the way because it's where you build trust. If I know that I can buy it and I can return it because it's a problem, with it. I know it's not, a thing, it's not a thing that we practice very often in the Caribbean, although we do have um, product return regulations, we typically don't engage in it. It's just the way that Caribbean um, consumers tend to operate. They'd be disgruntled, but they seldom return it. I don't like that. I would rather if my customer knows that their, their, their dissatisfactions are being met rather than just walking away from the business. This gives me as a business the opportunity to serve them better. Um, business operation necessities. Uh, we spoke about this briefly um, last week, I think, or the week before. We talked about risk management, protecting your business from hackers as well as fraud. Uh, are you equipped to manage the risk? Some of the things that we didn't talk about is that return process. Here in the United States, we have some of those issues where we have people who constantly return stuff. They buy them, use them, they return them. Buy them, they use them, return them. You have to look out for that and you have to put policies in place that would protect you from those things as well. Um, 
let's say you can do 10 to 20 returns per year. After that, you would have to keep the item. Those are policies that you can put in place to protect your business from someone who is a constant returner. Purchase management. Um, refer, refers to the sourcing of products, goods and services from different suppliers. Again, what I'm saying here is a repeat of what I've said before, because I'm repeating it because it's really, really important. Right? When you look at supply chain issues and what has occurred since COVID, these are the things that you're going to need to put in place, and these are the things that you should have automated. This is going, the automation in this is going to be dependent on your data analysis. Who is buying, as Leighton pointed out earlier? When are they buying? How much are they buying? Who are you getting it from? How much can they supply you with? And when can they supply you? We do not, and, and in my business, we do not engage in customer service. We do customer engagement from start to end because I'm not trying to acquire customers. I'm trying to build evangelists. People who are not just buying my product, people who are selling my product, who are selling my company. People are going out and constantly saying, this is a business that we trust, and this is where you should buy your products. Business intelligence and analysis, critical to ongoing operations of your business. Right? That data that you, we don't want you guessing and pulling numbers out of thin air. So we look at what the sales numbers are like, what the purchase numbers are like, what the demographics are like, who's purchasing, when are you purchasing, when are they purchasing? That numbers, you, those numbers you get from your business analysis, from crunching. You can get that from Google Analytics. You can get that from Adobe Analytics. The, the number of companies and those that, that does that type of crunching for you. We as well on our platform, we provide you with all of these reports from start to finish. Um, logistics, which I'm going to jump into in the next, my next set of slides more in depth. Um, Yeah, in, in yes. So this is one of the things that we look at when we look at global south challenges as opposed to global north challenges. In many developing countries, logistics is a real cost challenge. But how we how do we how do we use our complexity of transportation system to work for us? In the Caribbean, we do not have the the efficiency or the the high tech solutions of a FedEx and a UPS, and our post offices are not always the best. But we do have um, the, the, the what we what we would call it like the black market of logistics. You have your local couriers, the bicycle guys. You have I know in some places like St. Vincent, you have the guys who are pushing their cart around, who can do deliveries. You have local transportation, the guys who does the pickups at the port and drop off at the ports, at the airports. We have the small islands where. You use schooners between the islands. We have a mixture of solutions, not all high tech, but we are working on solutions to get them there that we can utilize. Um, very often, one, one of the products that we just recently developed is um, we utilize what transportation system exists within the country already. Like St. Vincent, we have minivans and um, we have maxi taxis in Trinidad, robots in Jamaica. We utilize those to make those deliveries. So local deliveries are handled by that. For a regional delivery, we integrate a company, um, Thriftpack, who I know have agents in a number of Caribbean countries. They do regional deliveries. Those pricing structures I'm going to send out to you guys um, soon. But they do, I can do a package between, I think it's 14, 10, 14 different Caribbean countries for less than 20 US, right? So. Those are solutions that are there. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. Present. What's the name of that company, please? Swiftpack. Don't worry, I'm going to send you all their rates and their different agents throughout the islands. They do they do product uh, they do packaging consolidations. So in rather than you bearing all of the cost of shipping something much larger, they would consolidate those packages. And then when they get to their destination, they would um unpack those and distribute them on your behalf. Uh, point of sale systems are really great as well if you have a brick and mortar solutions and you could afford to have this in place because this allows for proper automations of sales, uh, purchase management, and sales management. Again, in a nutshell, this is what e commerce operations look like. So there's a customer journey, and as a business, this is your journey on the back end. 
So you receive something from the delivery from their manufacturers if you're reselling, or even if you're making it and you're making it, you're getting it from your manufacturers. You verify that you receive it. You warehouse it. Your store can be your warehouse. In fact, that's the way of the future. We're trying to move away from where you have to invest in multiple locations of different warehousing. How could I utilize my, my brick and mortar space as a real-time warehouse? So I can handle in-store customers and I can handle my online customers from this single location. So once I warehouse it, I verify that it's warehoused. Starting and shelving, that's verified, right? I reuse tools on our platform for all of this, all scanning rather than, and I know in a lot of locations, people use pen and paper, but this is where you lose in terms of theft. Very often in, in a number of the Caribbean countries that I've been in, I see at certain time of the year, you have stock taken. So our businesses will close the doors for a couple of days to see what inventories they have in stock, what have they lost over that period of time. That is expensive. One, you're shutting your doors for a couple of days, and two, then you're going to find out that a good 20 to 30%, which is what the average is of your inventory is gone without you receiving payment for it. So having an automated system in place, whatever that system is, to verify what your inventory is, is going to be great. Uh, last mile delivery. Again, as a business, these are the things that you have to pay attention to. Communi communicate with the courier. So an order comes in, you package that order. It's time to go. You reach out to the courier. You say, I have a package. It's ready to go. You verify that it's well packaged. One of the things that we're going to talk about in the next session is the different laws that is now governing um, how you package your products. If you're like me and I live here in New York, I order something from Amazon and I get a box that is uh, this massive box that can hardly come to my door. Then I open it and there's this little package inside of it. Different governments are not proposing that you be, as a business, you would be charged up to $500 for every percentage over what it should have been. So let's say if I have a, my box should have been two by two and I have a four by four and that's a 200% charge and uh, $500 charge two times on top of the cost of that and uh, for shipping that package because it's waste. It's wastage. And in the economy that we're trying to go green, this is how they account for that. Um, in spaces like the Caribbean, we could choose not to package a lot of things in cardboard boxes and corrugated boxes, although that's probably the best solution because they're biodegradable. If you can actually hand off your packages in neatly packaged gift bags or a paper bags that are well decorated, that works as well. If you're doing local deliveries or if you're using products that are not that are not that fragile. Um, so we verify when the courier comes to pick it up, is a uh, communication taking place as well. All has, to, uh, for me, I always suggest that this is automated so that there's a constant record for insurance purposes and for customer communications, for customer engagement. Whenever it gets to the customer, we do a full electronic verification with our application. So if um, Leighton buys a product from me, that entire process, he can track as a customer up to the point where he actually receives it. When he does receive the package, we present you with a, a digital device where you sign and you say, yes, this is me and I receive my package. So there's no doubt that delivery took place. I verify that by, I follow up that by asking you, how is the service? Just as Leighton suggested. If there's going to be a return, I'm prepared for that return. Dissatisfied customer. I communicate with that customer. I set up my return process. I communicate with my courier. Hey, I need, I have a package that needs to be returned. The courier either shows up to you or I have the customer bring it back to my location if it's local. I do my refund, I verify the refund took place. I put this product back into inventory. If it is a product that is that can be resold. Very often we take those products back and we can sell them, resell them as bundled packages to other retailers, discount stores. Those are options. If you want to talk about those options later on, we can definitely do that. Um, so that's my slide on e-commerce operations. Any questions?
Any questions? No. Okay. Yes, you are getting access to these slides. I will, we'll, um, Philip would make them available for you guys. Gilbert, good question. Um, I don't remember if, I, if I'd answered it before, but I've recently come to learn that um, for some types of products that are kept cold, you know, um, cold storage um, has uh -huh. to be provided as part of the logistics support for those persons who want to export. Um, do you know of any regional supplier that provides cold storage um, logistics support? Um, Region regionally, no. I don't know of a solution that, that's specific to the region. I know tropical shipping. And a lot of these um, freight services are being consolidated. So it's usually best to just deal with your local agents, right? Mm -hmm. I know tropical shipping does a lot of re what they call reefer services throughout the region. They originate in different spaces in the world, but as they move between the islands to pick up containers from them and pick up a container in Jamaica and drop that off in the um, in, in um, St. Martin's. And then that container is picked up by another ship that's coming further south to Trinidad or someplace like that. But that's typically how the route runs. But I don't advise going directly to Tropical. Look for their local agent, which may be an agent of many of multiple services who can accommodate that. Like, for instance, as I talked about SwiftPack before, they have agents in each country. So this is why I'm going to post who the agents are, their local agents are. Okay. So in terms of in terms of um first world, so exporting to like um North America, Europe, I mean those are pretty much I think our primary export markets, right? Um in Jamaica, I know the the, the, the post office, the Jamaica Post is is one of the main solutions that persons use um for cheap rates but i've been hearing that you know um the delivery is flaky in terms of the delivery does get to you one thing that the product does get to where it should get to but the timeliness of of the of, of, of the delivery seems to be an issue um across the caribbean in other caribbean countries who are shipping outside of their um and so also have the region to these first world markets. Um, do you know what, what, what are the solution providers in, in each country? Is it generally the post office system in each country that works? Or are there, are there um, entities that specialize in, in shipping to these North America or European um, destinations that provide the shipping service in a, in a, in a reasonable manner, meaning that you know, it's timely, you get, you, I don't need to get tracking or anything like that. Do you, are you aware of anything like that um, for, the, for the countries? Yeah, yeah. so good question. So there, there are a couple of post offices throughout the region that has reasonably good solutions. Um, the people from Trinidad could verify this. Um, just I know Trinidad had, was doing some pretty good integrations into the US and the, and to the Canadians. Um, Postal services, so you can track a package from Trinidad using their services all the way to the United States. It's a handoff process. I know they were talking about it. I'm not sure if it's fully implemented. Anybody from Trinidad would comment. And Jamaica was was looking into doing the same as well. You were there late, and I don't know if they had actually completed that process where you can track from, from ship in Trinidad or Jamaica all the way to the US or Canadian system. But one right. of the problems with that still is um, it's expensive, All right? It has the been tracking, very expensive. The, the tracking service? No, the entire shipping service. Okay, okay, okay. 
I'm not aware of the tracking being available with it, which I think is where DHL and FedEx separate themselves um, from Jamaica Post. What I've heard of Jamaica Post is that delivery um, is fairly good for those countries in North America, but once it gets into the Caribbean delivery, it becomes very flaky. You know, so if somebody is shipping to somebody in Barbados or Trinidad from Jamaica, it's a whole different bargain. Jamaica right. right. shipping to the US or, or, or Canada is much simpler, much faster. Um, but right. once That's exactly what I was saying. Yeah, it becomes very, very, very tricky. Yeah, shipping throughout the region, no. Um, Swift um, Pack has a uh, tracking system. Uh, uh, something that they're introducing right now, um, Jetpack services. Um, we're testing it out to see how it goes. But um, thus far, you know, you can ship stuff from here to Grenada. Um, they have really good rates in terms of their cargo rates so far. Um, so we're just testing it out because they recently introduced it like last month. So we have Is some this? new um, Trinidad. And this is for Cal. Post office. For Cal. Okay. Not for the post office. Post office, we don't do that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm not, tra I'm not trusting Kitty Post to do anything to Grenada or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's sad, right? Right now, we're engaging with some of the post offices throughout the region because they're really struggling. They're really, really struggling. They still think that um, sending letters and, and selling postage is the way to make money. And it really isn't. Everybody else is sending emails. So mail isn't it. So we engage in some solutions with them, with, some, with a few of them right now. Hopefully that's going to be integrated throughout the region where you can track package from country to country. And who is Cal? Cal is? Um, Caribbean Airlines. Oh, Caribbean Airlines. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was having a conversation about just the movement of people in the Caribbean, how expensive and ridiculous that is. I'm not sure if package, if you say they're doing a much better deal with packages, then good. Yeah, well, the rate seems to be okay thus far. Yeah, and it's, it is ridiculous in terms of um how they move people. I mean, I used to work at BW, so I, I have an idea of why the rates are so high. But um, they are introducing more jet services throughout inter-island inter travel. They are doing their best. So, and then okay. uh, in general, you remember airfare kind of went up worldwide. So right. not, not defending Cal, I'm, I'm not a part of Cal. I'm just saying that we have logistic issues, but they are offering jetpack services right now. Yeah, logistic services are an issue throughout the region. As I said, that's one of the reasons we have invested quite a bit in developing uh, technology solutions that kind of bridge those gaps. It's just a matter of getting them implemented Again, because we deal with a lot of the local post offices and government agencies that govern them, they still are spearheading people selling, sending letters, buying a few stamps and sending a few letters, and that is not the solution. So getting across those barriers is going to, is, has been the challenge. Hopefully we get over those soon. Yeah. Uh, Gilbert, has right. Andrew has her hand up. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So I um I got an estimate to send a laptop from Kingston to Barbados to my son at Cave Hill. And it took us two days to get a quote. You have to send, you have to he has to complete the form to get the estimate, fit handwrite the form, then scan it, then send it across. And then it takes another three day, another two days or so to get the quote. And then they're telling me it's $155 US to, click, to, 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 to deliver the laptop. And then we write again and then say, does it include customs and all the clearing and so on. No, it doesn't. And, and then it was a public holiday. So we can't get the answers yet. So I, I guess by tomorrow we'll get the answer on that. So for me, um, this is a basic query. This is just query system. And it is it is beneath us. Any one of us, even which, Haiti, which, it is beneath service, us. Which service provider is this, Andrea? Um, Caribbean Airlines Cargo. Okay. So okay. D, DHL was charging me 250 without the customs. Now they are saying it's $155. And I don't know if it, well, as 
Gilbert says he, it's like that he doesn't include custom, but why not just say all of that? You know that's what we need to know. You know that this is your lane. So you know more than I do what I don't know. This goes back to what Leighton was talking about earlier, where and it's something that we have to instill in our businesses. Again, I'm I'm conducting this training knowing that you guys are not the one that is doing business, but you're the, you're the leaders. You have to instill in your businesses uh, the the need for clarity, clear communications, and customer engagement, customer satisfaction, customer service. This. This is, this is a failure of communication. It's not a failure of business. It's a clear failure of communication, which is going to cause business, if they had competition, to fail. This is this is rocket science. This is this doesn't engage what Leighton is talking about, where you have to understand the demographics of your consumers and channel. This is basic communications. Yeah, I agree. We, and this is where businesses fail a lot in the Caribbean. We have to engage them. We have to let them know this is critical. The masses that you're serving is changing and they're not going to accept this. If I'm working eight, 10, 12 hours a day for my money and then you're going to want to treat me like that, I'm not going to want to spend my money with you. Not if there's a competitor. We have to demand these things. Yeah. As it is in this space, you guys have to put that there to them. Have to let them know that this is a critical process in their business. I have a question, Gilbert. Shoot. So I'm talking, I'm thinking of organizational design. You have staff okay. meetings, you have staff meetings, you have senior management meetings. What on earth do you discuss if not how to how to drive your business forward and raise your brand and all those good stuff? What does strategy look like if not to get it from the people on the ground? Um, who have to deal with some serious curse words from Caribbean people. What, why don't you yet know that when you communicate, communicate one time? Why don't they know? Okay, so it's not a matter of not knowing or not understanding, right? People have been making money the way that they've been making money for a long time. There's no competitors in this space. Why would they change? Why should they change? I've been doing it this way. I could be rude to my customers. I could do all these other things to my customers and they still have to come back to me. Why should they change? That is, that is, that is, that is very true. And um, to, add, to add to that as well, this is really where digitization becomes, um, this is where the digitization process start to start to, to add to process improvement. Um, because as Gilbert mentioned, people have a way how they normally do business offline. And you're gonna find that doing business online requires a lot more information for a person to make a, a purchase. As I mentioned to you, there's not that person on the phone or in front of you having a conversation to say, the cost is $150. And then you say, oh, does it include clear, um, 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 duty? No, it doesn't include duty. All right, so what does it include? In it includes shipping and freight and this and that. There's not that, that there's not an opportunity for that conversation. It's because there's not that opportunity for that conversation. There needs to be far more documentation of the processes that need to be unlocked for the service to be provided. And this is where digitization starts to really change the way how um, companies do business. And this is also one of the reasons why we find that there are these large companies here in the Caribbean that are slow towards e-commerce and digitization because of this groundwork that they need to do to provide documentation. A lot of businesses out there, they are running, then they look like very big, professional first world companies, but they are really just big party shops, you know, where there is not a lot of clear definition of processes. And if you speak to one agent today, you get a different piece of information than if you speak to a different agent tomorrow or even on the same day. So this is where digitization really forces persons to think properly about who they are servicing, how they are providing the service, 
what information is needed to provide that service end to end. It's a far more sophisticated way of operating. And you'll find that any business that goes through that digital transformation process that is forced to undertake this level of documentation will be a business that operates at a far greater level than somebody who is not online. Yeah, and as BSOs, right, as you review the, your businesses, communications, what they have on their websites, these are the things that you pay attention to. You go through the entire process with them. Um, as a as a consumer, you go through their websites and you say, I'm going to take the customer journey. And where I find points of dissatisfaction, you have to change it. You fall under my BSO. You represented me as you go out there. I'm not sure if this is how it works, but this is how I'd like to see it perceived, like to see it work. These are the things that you need to fix. Because you're in a world where you're going to meet competitors. You're going to, in a world where you're going to have um, consumers who are not locally based, consumers who are more savvy. So no longer are we going to accept what you put out. I can tell you, prior to COVID, I have dealt with businesses where you try to introduce e-commerce to them and they'll tell you, e-commerce will not work. It's not going to work. And that, that's not because it's not going to work, because they were making money the way that they were making money. Why would they change? Why would they go and invest in something when they don't have a, a competitor? No. But the landscape is changing. I want to see small businesses that you guys are mentoring disrupt local markets, change the way that our, our local markets function. Okay, let me try to go. If you have any other questions, let me know, but I'm trying to get you these, eco these logistics slides as quickly as possible. Um, question, do you guys have a logistic plan in place? Logistic plan, which includes a return process. If you have a plan, raise your hand. If you don't, it's something that you're gonna need to work on as quickly as possible so that you could present to your businesses. I see no hands, which means this is something that we're going to need to put in place as quickly as possible. If you're yes. getting into an e-commerce market, you're going to need to have a return process in place. Go ahead, Andrew. Yeah, this is a difficulty in um, in uh, in services because as a philosophy, I don't endorse returning money at all. So okay. explain, <laughs> explain, please. <laughs> so if, for example, if, for example, um, you have a client that is a trainer and the trainer and the client is of the view that the workshop was not to his or her satisfaction and he paid for seven people for his firm and so on and so forth. He expected more and then he calls and he says to my client, um, you know, you, we really feel that there should be a money back guarantee that we should have engaged in and so on and so forth. And he really go, goes on badly. What would you advise our client to do? Well, let, let me jump on yeah. that. Um, yeah, let me jump on that. Okay, okay. all right, go ahead. In go ahead. The, I, 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 can, I, can, I can relate to it. Uh, what I will say is that um, a return policy, a logistics, a logistics plan includes your return policy, right? Um, or translation policy. And you determine what goes into that translation policy. Now, a policy does not mean that you have to honor returns and pay back persons money, or you have to give persons back when the cancellation. But what you need to do is provide terms around how that is handled. So if it's a workshop, it's a non-refundable workshop. So once you come in, you know, say, oh, now you better come back to us with no refund argument because that once you pay for it, <laughs> it is done and dusted. It's the same thing with online tickets. Um, yeah. I tried to purchase an online ticket recently for a show that was held in Jamaica with Jarul and Ashanti. Um, and uh, when I, there was an issue with, 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 with the charge where it just said it was canceled on the website, but I got a text message from my bank saying a charge was applied. When I reached out to the service provider, 
They said that, hey, we don't provide refunds. It did not come through. We do not provide refunds, yada, yada, yada. I went, to, I had an event recently as well with a, this cooking event, a, a food event. And for some reason, I, I could not end up, I could not go to the event. So I reached out to the service provider, hey, I'd like to refund my ticket. Policy is that we have no refunds. So the bottom line is that um, as part of your logistics plan, it is important to outline what the terms and conditions are around your provision of service. So if it is that your service does not include a refund policy, then clearly state that it doesn't include a refund policy. And you will find that once you get into e-commerce, every single payment gateway service provider in Jamaica, especially First Atlantic, will, will want to see, of course, your shopping page set up, your logistics um, agree, um, set up, but most importantly, want to see on your website the terms and conditions for your service because that is what manages the expectation from the customer. So you set like a checkbox that person sign at the bottom of the page right before you take place order. You want to ensure that with those terms and conditions around your logistics, your refund, your everything that comes with the service itself is being addressed there so that you can um you can manage those expectations. If plan it, to have a plan does not mean that you are honoring refunds and, and translations. It means that you have a policy for it that you can communicate to customers as part of their buying process, not after they're bought, but as right. part of the process. You understand? Thanks a lot. I have a question. May I? May I ask may sure. I follow up? So the well, difficulty, the, sorry, please. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. So um, the difficulty that I find for many of our small business clients is that they bat we all battle with the um, Caribbean philosophy of if it's if I'm not so a near so. So mm -hmm. the belief in what they hear, by the time you you address the fact that they want a refund, the number of people, which is where I was intrigued. I was intrigued about the number of positive ads in the space. Wherever that space is, the number of, of recommendations and good reviews, I think is fundamental, especially in the battle against the few um, negative ones. Mm -hmm. So many times people, businesses, especially small businesses, repay or refund or partially refund or compensate um, irate customers or clients um, because of the fear of the wagon tongue. Right, right, right. So, you know, and especially if it's an influ influential noise, then, right. it, you know, it, 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 it brings fear. Um, right. And then they, and they lose off transactions sometimes, even if it's not their fault. Right. And unfortunately, they don't necessarily listen to us in, in that regard so much. Um, you know, the best we do is to list both pros and cons right. and so on. Yeah. Um, how do we, how, what, what is our language about around that? All right. So you see where that is concerned in my experience. Again, our policy, which is a standard for all, does not mean that you cannot make exceptions to the rule, especially where you believe that damage could possibly be done. At the end of the day, as man, business managers, one of our primary rules is to damage just to do damage control right so you have some instances where um you've done everything that you should have done as a business you've honored your obligation and the customer is still disgruntled now this is where your company culture comes into play and this is where you as a business have to choose how you go above and beyond to engender trust and to be seen as a fair company because the reality, as I mentioned, is that bad news spread faster than good news, right? So they, if, if 10 people hear about the good reviews, 100 will hear about the bad reviews. And I don't want that, right? The, the, the hope, however, is that those instances will be so few and far in between that if you do go against your policy to, 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 to smooth things over, um, it should not financially impacts you negatively, you understand? What you want to do is ensure that you don't have too many instances of that case by providing clear communication upfront and managing those expectations. But there will always be 
the exception to the rule where you may have to just say, Chuck, for peace sake, let's just refund the customer. I've done that many times. My policy in my business is not to fight with customers. If a customer feel like they have not been fairly um, 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 dealt with or fairly compensated or fairly, I got, I got a fair experience with my business, I try to I try to satisfy the customer as best as possible because again when it comes back to lifetime value, the same it's the same customer who is quick to cost you, the same customer who will be quick to make noise about you. And people are oftentimes judged by how they deal with negative situations and circumstances. So you as a as a business, each business has to determine how they are going to approach conflict with their customers when it arises and, and have a plan for that. So it goes back into the operational plan. Um, I mean, I know Gilbert mentioned a logistics plan there, but that all fits within an operational plan and how you deal with disgruntled customers because they will come and disgruntled customers can sometimes become your greatest advocate if you resolve their issues in an amicable way. And they can also become your greatest enemies. They will walk on every single social media platform and plaster your name negatively there. I, I see there's this, there's this page in Jamaica called Dear Dream where everything that is bad is talked about. And when it is talked about, it's hundreds of thousands of people see it at the same time. You don't want to find your business being talked about on a, on a platform like that. You know, so each company has to, has to determine what their policy is around that. It will differ from company to company, but again, guys, when you understand lifetime value of your customers, you will have to determine what measures you are willing to go to secure that lifetime value. Yeah, well said, well said, well said, Leighton. Yeah, see so a question, what is it called? What, what exactly is it, um, Andrea? Um, the, the website with the um, wagging tongues. Oh, oh, oh. Well, no, it's not a website. It's a social media page called Dear Dream. If you ask any young person, they'll know about it. One of those. Uh, so you of, are assuming I'm not young, right? No, 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 no. I'm saying that. Oh, no, what was, the, what was the term you spoke quickly? What is it? Oh, the name of it is Dear Dream. Dear Dream is the name of the page. So. D A R E? E E D E A R. Dream. Dear Dream. Okay. Okay. It's, a popular, it's a popular Jamaican social media page that people just talk about anything and everything. Um, but it's it's a community that that um, will highlight good and also blast what is bad. You know? A lot of commentary. Um, back to you, Robert. We're at 12 o'clock. Back to you. Yeah, so we, we're pretty much out of time, but we're gonna just um, say that what we're talking about here is communications. Right, this is critical in the e-commerce space. <clears throat> and as BSOs, we have to lead our businesses in terms of that communications. All right, um, the cost. So we one of the one of the one of the modules that I previously had was one called principles and practices. So we talk about the principles in terms of this is the principle: we don't do returns. And certainly within the service industry, if it's an event ticket, that type of stuff. But do we offer you an opportunity to resell it before the event is passed? If you're dissatisfied, but again, all this has to be clearly stated prior to the purchase. If not, if it's not clearly stated, you do not have a choice but to actually refund it. Because your, your payment gateways, if I make a complaint to my credit card company that I made a purchase on your website. I was not satisfied with what I had. First thing the credit card company is going to ask me, was their return policy? Yes. No. Was it clearly stated? If it was not clearly, if it was a yes and it's not clearly stated, no. They're going to investigate. More than likely, they're going to refund me my money. They're going to charge you. They're going to hit you with a charge back. And it's going to be a negative on you which means you could possibly lose your ability to process credit cards on your website. This now goes to the next step that Leighton was saying. Now you have to re-examine that and say, is this a risk that I'm willing to take? More than likely, it's not. So on a one-by-one -one basis, you can deal with difficult customers and you could write that into your process as well. 
not on your website, but into your business processes. This is how we're going to deal with difficult cases on a one-by-one -one basis. We're going to hear this customer out, hear what the challenges are with what happened, and then we make a judgment call. Communications, write out those processes, have your processes written out as the best of your ability. Okay, um, next week I'm going to pick up, pick up from where we leave off here today. Um, I should be able to get you this pretty quickly. I'm going to try to send out these slides for you today so that you could probably go over them and we don't have to take a long time here next week. You just have a few questions to ask. All right, so see you guys next Thursday, same place, same time. Thanks again for being here. Yeah, just to announce before you go, guys. Thank you. Um, um, I just sent an email with the recordings of session two and session three, the YouTube link, as well as modules two, three, and four. And if, and if that's the that's the that's a PowerPoint. Yeah. So so yeah. So the modules that were um, presented by Leighton and and Gilbert. Yeah, there are three PowerPoints, and there are two links. Um, to set um one is session two's um recording and session three's recording on YouTube. Yeah. Good. Hi. Good day. We're no. meeting next week. Yes. Yeah. Next week is going to be our last session. Oh, okay. Hi, Philip. I'm going to send out today's slides, and so that you guys could go over them as well. And, so and you'll get the meeting link today. um in due in due course. Oh, oh. So what happens next after that? Right. So in all now, you should be engaging your companies. Remember, I said that I'm going to do an annotated version of the checklist, which I did on Solving Monkey and Center. A really annotated version. There are 16 responses yet. So I'm not sure if you. If most of you are using it to engage um, with your potential um, companies, that you, you remember, you need to get five companies to walk along right. with you to her. Uh, at, at least five. At, at least five. five. At least five. Sixty responses to date. Um, Trinidad, J um, Jamaica, Dominica, mainly. Hello. Oh, can we get the list from Jamaica? Yes, I will. Um, a little later today because we, we have an engagement. Sure. Yeah, in a few minutes. Um, sure. Hello. Yes. Yes. Hello. Good. Good day, Philip. Um, just wanted to clarify the initial form that um companies were asked to fill out. Um, did you get any responses from Guyana? Right. So I will do a complete audit of the original checklist, and I will send to each um BSO if um companies from their countries, okay? If you don't receive an email that states that, it means there were no entries on that original checklist. I will also do an audit of the more recent form that was the Survey Monkey one that was sent out, I think last week, with the 16 responses so far. I will audit that also and I will send. If you don't receive an email indicating that, there were this many companies from your country. It means, therefore, that e on either the checklist or the survey monkey, no responses from your country, which means that you have to make an extra effort using the survey monkey um, survey to, to onboard your five companies, your five or more. Okay. Companies. I'll await that email. Thank you. Thank you so much. Give, give yeah, me a couple and, and of as hours. You guys, company. as quickly as possible, try to get this list to us because we would want to start a review. Yeah, so um, we could have yeah, because you know, we can select yeah. a, so a, a good distribution of companies uh, along the adoption journey, you know, for, to help with our impact analysis. Yeah, and right. Course, so can you so so you said before that you were going to send the list of the ones for Jamaica? Can you do that, please, so that we yeah, can know right. I'm going to do an audit of entire the both check the checklist and the survey and communicate with you starting this evening. Grateful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. Hi, everyone. You Thanks week. for your super support and, and going forward. I, I was shaping up to be a really great team and I'm very excited and I'm content. Yes. Bye. Everyone, guys. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you.